Okay, everybody, it's just about one o'clock. I'm, I'm going to wait for a few more minutes before we get started. People are still joining. So we'll start in just a minute. Okay, I guess I guess I'll get started. Uh, more SAB members may be coming on, but I think we have a good number of, of the SAB members. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tom Armitage from the EPA Science Advisory Board office. Uh, I'm the designated federal officer for the EPA Science Advisory Board. And I would like to convene this public meeting of the Science Advisory Board. And I'd just like to make a few uh, brief remarks in my capacity as the DFO before we get started. The SAB is meeting today and on March 7th to conduct a consultation with EPA to discuss recommendations received from a work group regarding the review of science supporting planned EPA actions and to conduct a quality review of an SAB report. Uh, I'd first like to note that the Science Advisory Board is an independent expert federal advisory committee. It's chartered under the authority of the Federal Advisory Committee Act and it's empowered by law to provide scientific and technical advice to the EPA administrator. Science Advisory Board meetings and deliberations are held as public meetings that meet the requirements of the Federal Advisory Committee Act. The discussions of the SAB and its interactions with the public and EPA are conducted in sessions where I, as the DFO, am present to ensure that the requirements of the Federal Advisory Committee Act are met. The Federal Advisory Committee Act also requires that public meetings provide an opportunity for public comment. And I will note that there is a public comment period on the agenda for this meeting. Members of the public who have registered in advance with the SAB office can make oral comments uh, during the comment period. And we have received requests to speak at this meeting from a number of people. Uh, we've also received written public comments for this meeting. And I'll note that any written comments that we receive are made available to SAB members and posted on the meeting website. I'd also like to note that the minutes of this meeting will be prepared to summarize the discussion and the actions in accordance with the requirements of the Federal Advisory Committee Act. The minutes will be certified by the SAB chair and posted on the SAB website. I also want to let all meeting attendees know that we have provided members of the public access to this meeting 
through a teleconference line and a live webcast, and that all materials discussed are available on the SAB website. The SAB consists of special government employees appointed by the EPA. Members are serving as independent scientific and technical experts and not as representatives of any group. And as government employees, SAB members are subject to applicable ethics laws. And I wanna note that SAB office has determined that members participating in this meeting have no financial conflicts of interest or appearance of lack of impartiality concerning the topics on the agenda. So I'm gonna take roll to note who's here, but for, uh, for the record, I'd like to ask anyone listening on the webcast to send me an email to let me know, members of the public, that you're on so I can keep track of the attendees. And my email address is on the SAB website. Uh, also, I'd like to note that since some members of the public are on the phone, members, if you could please just identify yourselves when you're speaking so that those who are listening on the phone know who's speaking. So now I'm gonna take the roll. And so I'd just like to ask members of the board to indicate, to confirm that you're present when I call your name, please. Dr. Allison Cullen. Present. Dr. Marjorie Aileon. Present. Dr. David Allen. Dr. Susan Annenberg. Present. Dr. Florence Anorio. Present. Dr. Joe Arvai. Present. Dr. Barbara Beck. Present. Dr. Roland Benke. Present. Dr. Tammy Bond. Present. Dr. Mark Borsuk. Present. Dr. Sylvie Bruder. Present. Dr. Jay Chakraborty. Present. Dr. Amin Chen is not present today. Uh, Dr. Amy Childress. Present. Dr. Wei Su Chu. Present. Thank you. Dr. Ryan Emanuel. Present. Mr. Earl Fordham. Present. Dr. John Guckenheimer. I thought I saw present, you. Present. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you very much. Dr. Steve Hamburg. Present. Dr. Marcus Hendricks. Dr. Celine Hernandez Ruiz. Dr. Alina Irwin. Present. Dr. David Kieser. Uh, present. Uh, Mark, Dr. Mark LeChevalier is not present today. Dr. Angela Lung. Present. Dr. Uh, Ms. Lisa Lonefight. Dr. Lala Ma. Present. Dr. John Morris. Present. Dr. Enid Neptune. Present. Dr. Sheila Olmsted. Present. Dr. Austin Omer. Present. Dr. Gloria Post. Present. Dr. Christy Pullen Fednick. Present. Dr. Amanda Rodewald. Present. Dr. Emma Rossi. Present. Thank you. Dr. John Samet. Present. Dr. Leanne Shepard. Present. Dr. Drew Schindel. Present. Dr. Jenny Smith. Present. Dr. Richard Smith. Present. Dr. Daniel Stram. Present. Dr. Peter Thorne. Present. Dr. Godfrey Uzo Chukwu. Present. Dr. Wei Sung Wang. Present. Dr. June Weintraub. Present. Dr. Sikobi Wilson. Present. Dr. Dominic van der Mensbrook. Present. Thank you. And now the board liaisons, Dr. Robert Chapin. Dr. Paul Gilman? Yes. Dr. Thank you. Dr. Daniel Schlenk? Present. 
Dr. Dina Schur. Present. Okay, great. Thank you all very much. And with that, I'm now going to turn the meeting over to Tom Brennan, uh, Director of the SAB Office for Introductory Remarks. Hey, thanks, Tom. And welcome, everyone. It's, it's great to have everyone in attendance at this public meeting of the Science Advisory Board. I want to take a moment to share a few appreciations. Uh, first, I want to thank members of the public who are here today to comment and to those of you who have sent in written comments. So thank you for participating in this. I'd like to thank the SAB members. It's, it's nice to see so many of you here today. And on behalf of the agency, I just want to personally thank you for your service, your public service that you do advising the agency. I know you're taking time out of your, your busy professional lives and it's much appreciated. To my colleagues from around the EPA who developed the content that went into this meeting, thank you. And uh, you'll see some presentations uh, outlining some work that they've done uh, over the last several months to help us prepare. And to uh, my colleagues in the SAB staff office and our contractor, I definitely want to thank you for all the hard work that you've done to uh, pull this meeting together. This is the first meeting of the SAB this year. And, uh, but we have, the SAB has been busy in other ways. We have a ser uh, several panels that have been meeting on topics such as PFAS drinking water standards and the Office of Water Contaminant Candidate List, uh, number five, and a, and a project we're taking on today, the Multi-Agency Radiation Survey and Site Investigation Manual. I guess we're doing that next week on the Monday meeting. And we have several more projects that are, uh, should be scheduled to begin in the months ahead. Uh, so I'm excited about that. So we have, we have a busy workload and um, I'm definitely looking forward to it. And included in this future workload will be projects uh, that will be subject of identified by the SAB to look at proposed rules that come through the agency. And we had a new process that just went live uh, earlier this week. And the SAB themselves will be identifying EPA proposed rules from which they may want to comment on. And on the second day of our meeting, we'll have some um, some projects come through like that. Um, is Janet McCabe here? Let's Not yet? Well, why don't I introduce our chair? I'm Dr. Allison Cullen, and, and Allison will kind of watch together, and when Janet arrives, we'll give her uh, some time to say hello. All right. Thanks so much, Tom. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Allison Cullen. I'm the chair of the EPA Science Advisory Board. And I would like to welcome members of the Chartered Board. It's very exciting to have our first public meeting. Uh, SAB liaisons and EPA staff, whose hard work is very much appreciated, and others to this public meeting. And I'd really like to offer gratitude to the SAB staff office, Tom Brennan, director, Tom Armitage, Zida Figueroa, and all their colleagues for supporting the board in this meeting. The meeting being held today and on March 7th is to provide advice to EPA and to conduct SAB business. We are providing consultative advice to EPA on research needed to improve the state of science, supporting cumulative impacts assessments. And in addition, we will be discussing recommendations received from the SAB work group for review of science supporting EPA decisions with regard to review of planned EPA actions. Uh, the SAB is also going to be conducting a quality review of the draft report review of the multi-agency radiation survey and site investigation manual, which is revision two. I would like to briefly review our agenda. We have received requests from members of the public to provide oral public comments. So the first item of business is to hear public comments. Public comments will be limited to three minutes per speaker. And if there are questions from EP, um, SAB members for the speakers, I'd like to limit them to one question per speaker. And then I would ask that speakers provide brief responses. There's also a second public comment period on the agenda. So members of the public who would like to provide short two or three minute clarifying comments near the end of the meeting on March 7th, next Monday, should send an email to the designated federal officer, Tom Armitage, before the scheduled break during the March 7th meeting. And Tom Armitage email address is on the SAB meeting website. After the public comment period, the chartered SAB will conduct the consultation with EPA on research needed to improve the state of the science supporting cumulative impact assessments. And we will first hear EPA presentations. We will welcome Dr. Chris Frey, Deputy Assistant Administrator in EPA's Office of Research and Development, and he'll offer opening remarks. 
And then we'll hear presentations from Drs. Ann Wolverton and Chris Dawkins of EPA's National Center for Environmental Economics. This will be on the application of cumulative impact assessment to national and regional scale decision making. Then we'll hear a presentation from Dr. Timothy Barzik of EPA's Office of Research and Development on the application of cumulative impact assessment to local scale community decisions. And then finally, we'll hear a presentation from Ms. Susan Julius, also of EPA's Office of Research and Development. And this will be on EPA's white paper titled Cumulative Impacts, Recommendations for ORD Research. SAB members and board liaisons will then discuss our responses to EPA's charge questions on this topic. EPA's white paper and the consultation charge questions um, have been given to the SAB previously, and they're also included in the meeting materials posted on the SAB website. I will be asking all SAB members to provide final individual written comments in response to the charge questions after this meeting, and a compilation of these individual comments will be transmitted to the EPA administrator. I know it's a lot. I'm hoping we can complete the discussion of responses to the consultation charge questions before we recess today. If we need more time for the discussion, I could consider uh, extending the meeting time a little later today and or continuing the consultation discussion on March 7th. So uh, and, Allison, if, yeah. if I might jump in, um, it's Deputy Administrator Janet McCabe has joined the call and it's Wonderful. my pleasure to introduce her. She was sworn in on April 29th, 2021 as the agency's 16th deputy administrator. And I wanna thank you on behalf of this whole group, uh, Janet, for joining us here today. And, and I'll turn it over to you for some opening remarks. Hey, everybody. Um, hang on a second, I'm gonna readjust my camera here. Having a few technical difficulties this morning um, with my equipment, as I'm sure that you guys do on a regular basis too, or maybe not. Maybe maybe it's it's just me. Um, but I'm 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 really pleased to be joining you. And the first thing I want to say is just the biggest, hugest thank you to all of you for being willing to put your time and energy into being on this group. Um, it is so critical for EPA's work and for um, us being able to deliver on our mission um, to be able to look to a distinguished an expert group of people like you um, representing a wide variety of disciplines um, with which we and our policymaking are concerned um, and being able to turn to you, to rely on you um, uh, and to work with you as we um, develop the underlying science that is so critical to um, any and all of the policies that we, um, uh, that we develop and, 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 and implement. Because if they're not grounded, in, um, in data and science, they will not be effective ultimately. Um, so, so, so thank you so much. Um, and uh, I'm particularly thrilled to be at, at this meeting, um, which is, I understand is the first meeting that you're having since the, uh, the board was reset um, in 2021, if I, if I have that right, um, uh, with, with two particular standing committees, climate science and environmental justice, um, that's a bullseye, two bullseyes um, for two of the key priorities of the Biden-Harris administration, Administrator Regan, and all of us here at EPA. So um, really looking forward to working with, um, with all of you, but also with you in, in those configurations where you're going to um, be focused on uh, a, a couple of the most top priority things that, that we are focused on also. Um, uh, I um, uh, know that you're, you've got a lot of things on, on, on your agenda today. Um, uh, one in particular is um, ORD's cumulative impacts assessment white paper. Um, uh, so critical for us to get your, your feedback on that. Um, th this has a, been a long time coming in my view um, as somebody who's worked in mostly the air quality field for, for my career with a foray into uh, children's environmental health um, through a little nonprofit I worked with. Um, we, we, uh, <clears throat> we've, we, we, we're, we're experienced with the um, historical, traditional um, um, mismatch, if that's the right word, perhaps it's not, I'm sure there's a better word, uh, between the uh, environmental facility by facility um, and yet recognizing that that's not people's lived experience. People's lived experiences 
all the things that they're exposed to um, in their neighborhoods and uh, the cumulative and uh, synergistic impacts um, that those have, along with all the other things that are going on in their lives, um, which some people refer to as the social determinants of, of health as well. Um, and we can't really do the job of, of protecting public health if we're not thinking about those things. So, uh, but this is, um, this is new territory to, to many of us um, and uh, to many others who are active in uh, the field of environmental and health protection, including our state co-regulators um, who implement so much of the nation's environmental laws. So um, uh, this is um, gonna be a very important work for us to do together. Um, I wanted to mention also the, um, the, the memo, um, science supporting EPA decisions that was just issued um, uh, this, earlier this week or last week, and the, the, the days are running together. Um, but we're so pleased um, to, to have that uh, memo finalized and out into the world and into your hands and to begin implementing it. Um, and uh, it just goes back to what I was saying at the beginning, which is that um, uh, uh, strong science, um, uh, peer reviewed science, transparent science is absolutely essential to this administration, to this agency. And, um, and I hope that this process, this revised process and procedure will, um, will be the right approach to making sure that you have your eyes on the things that are coming and can, can give us your views about, well, you know, actually nothing new to see here, carry on, or yep, some new things to see here, and, and here's how we propose to, to take a look at them. And I think that uh, you've seen a number of things out of the agency that are all directed towards um, uh, re-emphasizing uh, the agency's commitment to scientific integrity um, and to using science to base our decisions on. So um, this was another uh, step in that direction. So um, I, I think those were kind of the key points that I wanted to make. I, I, I certainly hope that I'll have other opportunities to interact with you. Um, you can be sure that I will be following your work um, and the advice that you deliver to the agency. Um, even if I'm not in your meetings, um, I'll definitely be following it. Um, stay cl in close touch with, with Tom and others who interact with you on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and I'm just ever so grateful to your public service. I know you all have incredibly busy lives. I spent the last four years um, kind of hanging on to the edge of academia, um, which is uh, not, not my natural field. Um, uh, it was a wonderful experience, very, very different from being a, a career government person, uh, but I completely appreciate how busy academics are. I know not all of you are academics, but many of you are. Um, and that um, finding time to carve out for something like this and, and also recognizing that you, you can't just skate over this obligation. Um, if you stand up and say, I'm, I'm gonna do this, then that, that means a time commitment. Um, and uh, I, I have served on EPA advisory committees myself. And, um, and if you're gonna do it right, it's a time commitment. So, um, so we're really, really grateful. So with that, I, I don't know if anybody has any questions, but I'm happy to pass the, the lead back to, to, to our chair, Dr. Cullen, and, and uh, stay for it as, as long as I can or as long as you want me to. Thank you so much, Deputy Administrator McCabe. Uh, are there any questions since you offered that up? I'll, I'll yeah. offer that to the group if there are any. Well, I'm sure we all appreciate your public service and, uh, and look forward to staying in touch with, with our work as we move forward. And thank you so much for all your work supporting developing a process for us and, and helping our board get seated and all the other pieces that it took to get us in place today. So thank you so much. All right, that sounds great. Thank you so much. And I will say goodbye and leave you to your important work. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. All right. All right, I will continue. We're just reviewing the agenda, which is what I was in the midst of, but it was just wonderful to have that um, the visit from Deputy Administrator McCabe, such a, such a lovely vote of confidence and uh, support. So reviewing our agenda, I think I was as far as uh, giving a quick overview of what we're doing today. And so I'll turn to Monday, March 7th. So we'll reconvene on Monday, uh, March 7th, and that'll be 1 p.m. Eastern time, 10 a.m. on the West Coast where I am. And we'll be discussing recommendations provided to the chartered SAB in a memo from the SAB work group for review of science supporting EPA decisions. 
And this work group sent the SAB recommendations concerning review of science supporting two EPA regulations. We will decide whether we as a board agree with the work group recommendations and decide what follow-up activities are needed, if any. The memorandum is posted in the materials for this meeting on the SAB website so that all may have a look at that as well. At the meeting on Monday, March 7th, we'll also conduct a quality review. This is of a draft report prepared by the um, advisory committee, the SAB Radiation Advisory Committee on the Multi-Agency Radiation Survey and Site Investigation Manual, MARSIM. This report was prepared by the RAC and augmented with additional subject matter experts. All draft reports like this one that are prepared by SAB committees and panels undergo quality review and they must be approved by the chartered SAB before they are transmitted to the EPA administrator. So this is important work for us as well. Before we begin with today's agenda, I'd like to ask SAB members if they have any questions about any of the items on the agenda. And I'll ask Tom Armitage to help me track if hands go up. It's a little hard to track each thing on the screen. Are there any questions about the agenda? I have a quick question. Um, if we have the opportunity to provide additional comments on the um, on the Marsden report, would those be able to be incorporated before next week? Yes, all of us will be able to put final comments, uh, final written comments, and we, we'll also um, come to closure as a board on um, the Marsden report since that's a quality review. Um, yeah, so yes. Other questions? All right, I'm not seeing hands and Tom is not signaling me. So I will then turn to the public comment session. This is our time to hear from members of the public who've registered to provide oral comments. Speakers will be presenting their comments in the order in which the requests were received by the SAB office. I'll call each speaker and then ask that he or she limit comments to no more than three minutes. If SAB members have a question for the speaker, we'll try to allow time for one question with each speaker. Please note the SAB has also received written public comments and those comments are posted on our meeting webpage and they're available to SAB members. All right, so the first speaker on our list today is Brandy Crawford Johnson. Please present your comments. Do we have Brandy? I don't, don't see her. I see Brandy, are you in the meeting? Let's go to our second speaker. We can always circle back uh, if Brandy should, should join us. Our next speaker is Rachel Dawn Davis from Water Spirit. Please present your comments. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent, thank you. My name is Rachel Dawn Davis. I am public policy and justice organizer for Water Spirit, a nonprofit center for spiritual ecology sponsored by the Sisters of St. Joseph of Peace and occupying Lenny Lenape land, also known as New Jersey. Our mission is to protect water at the source by making a preferential option for the poor and most vulnerable. And we applaud the EPA for convening this panel to address the many gaps in scientific understanding about the cumulative impacts of pollution. The initial independent cross-agency effort to study radioactive material is vital. However, we find the pathways for engagement to be still too limited. Two to three minute comments in English exclusively will certainly limit true public input, particularly from the most impacted communities. Risks to unwilling sacrificed, unwillingly sacrificed communities are laid bare through over a decade of research. Recent reports in 2022 now link infant sickness and early adult mortality with proximity to oil and gas infrastructure. Domestic energy policy requires renewable energy mobilization now with distributed energy solutions available today. Given the overwhelming scientific evidence, we encourage the EPA to accelerate an immediate shift to renewable energy through a widespread multi-agency and granular effort. This effort could finally propel the USA toward energy independence, toward peace. Preventable sickness and death is costly cumulatively. Human physical and mental health cost is not limited to just workers and their families. It is not limited to those losing both children and older people living in proximity to oil and gas infrastructure and other related toxic industries, but whole communities and the humans who visited these communities over generations. Earth ravaged for short-term profits and for few still today helped along with legislative loopholes 
adding to the known unknowns and uncertainty. This ecological sin has permanently tarnished the existence and memories of healthy wildlife trees and streams. What always could have been what could still be peace. In closing, what we do to earth, we do to ourselves. This data being compiled for the first time is telling in and of itself. Agencies and community coming together to provide groundwork for a livable climate and future is a great idea. May the EPA and all related committees have the fortitude to focus on renewable energy solutions rooted in community engagement that is looking together at what peace-filled future we wish for our children. We look forward to ongoing dialogue. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Members, any questions for the speaker? Seeing no hands, I will, oh, Christy, please go ahead. Yeah, so just one quick question about the, the first statement about pathways for engagement being limited. I just wanted to follow up on that. Did you did, Were you saying that the pathways for engagement in this particular uh, review document was limited as well, or is it a broad statement just to get a little clarity on that? Thank you so much. I appreciate that. It is definitely a broader statement, but it could be even, you know, taken, I know this is an initial effort. Y'all are doing a really, really great job of trying, um, but from my perspective and from where I sit and speaking with agencies the last couple of years, it does seem like there is a, a very much a, a want and need for sort of the managerial level to get this sorted and to really, you know, move forward together again towards a livable future away from fossil fuel. Um, and so the opportunities still even are within, you know, this realm still limited just because of the the breadth of the of the toxicity that has has occurred over time and, and honestly still occurs. And as I said, I I'm zooming in from occupied Lenny Lenape land in New Jersey, where we have the first cumulative impacts law in the books on, you know, supposedly going to be implemented. And we also have gas plants that are purportedly, you know, slated for, for approval still. So that's what I, where I'm coming from. There's a lot of frustration that I felt it necessary to share today because there are so many other people who are not, you know, privy to these opportunities. Perfect. Thank you so much. That's great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you both. Our next speaker is Naomi Yoder from Healthy Gulf. Naomi, please present your comments. Great, thank you so much. Um, my name is Naomi Yoder. I'm a staff scientist at Healthy Gulf. Healthy Gulf's purpose is to collaborate with and serve communities who love the Gulf of Mexico by providing research, communications, and coalition building tools needed to reverse the long pattern of over-exploitation of the Gulf's natural resources. I want to give comments on behalf of all people and biological systems overburdened with pollution. I work on the Gulf Coast, especially with environmental justice communities and communities that are already overburdened with pollution. I want to urge the Science Advisory Board and the EPA to fully evaluate cumulative impact of fossil fuel facilities and operations on the Gulf Coast. Cumulative impact needs to be enormously expanded to provide a thorough, rigorous evaluation of cumulative impact that exists and those that would occur with a new facility. Cumulative impact should refer to evaluating environmental and ecological degradation on a holistic scale. Defining items that needed to be, that should be included in a cumulative impacts review start with several dimensions, um, including geographic inclusion, industrial sectors inclusion, temporal inclusion, environmental justice and climate justice inclusion, and life cycle inclusion for each project. I review air, water, and wetlands permit permits <clears throat> and NEPA document. <clears throat> excuse me. NEPA documents for fossil fuel, including petrochemical facilities, primarily in Louisiana and Texas. I see on a weekly basis the amount of pollution that is permitted just in terms of point source industrial emissions and water pollution. I do not see the permits requiring an analysis of the surrounding facilities. In some cases, multiple air pollution permits will be issued for one chemical complex with the justification apparently that they are separate 
units, even though they're owned by the same company or on the same campus and provide services for the larger complex. This is piecemealing in order to achieve compliance. Furthermore, when an area is in non-attainment for NACs, one, for one of the criteria pollution pollutants, let's say, the NACs non-attainment area is larger than just one plant. So NACs applies to all of the plants in the evaluated region. Why then are the permits issued on a case-by-case -case basis per project, per plant, instead of a cumulative basis. That system also places the burden of proof on the agencies and thus our public dollars, which has many problems. If organizations like mine or fence line groups wanna challenge NAC's attainment, for example, we must spend exorbitant amounts of money to commission studies to prove the non-attainment. Why shouldn't the companies pay for independent, regular and random monitoring so that they must prove that they are in compliance every month and not every year, as is the case now. This example from air pollution is echoed in many other areas where cumulative impact reviews are either not completed or are completed in a very cursory manner and do not include uh, environmental justice, climate justice, and other cumulative impacts. It seems like the whole system needs to be turned upside down. That's the end of my comments. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Members, any questions for the speaker? Looks like we have Jacoby. Yeah, so thank you for those comments. And uh, this is my first SAB meeting. So I apologize to the SAB staff because uh, I'm a former member of the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council. So I don't want to go, people know me, I'm going to go my knee jack route. But I think very important comments here. And I just want to say that these are discussions that we've had on NEJAC just for the SAB staff, SAB team. Uh, there's ongoing discussions about NEPA. And I feel like the Naima's comments speak to the issues around NEPA and how we need to have cumulative impacts. So part of the scientific questions, how do we get cumulative impacts into the NEPA review? Uh, also, uh, you know, back to Naomi, do you have any thoughts about um, health impact assessments being included in that process? And then your points about the permitting and non-attainment space, how do we use, what are some of the scientific methods that you think would be important to capture the, the cumulative burden of facilities and impacts uh, within one media and across media, as you were alluding to, uh, in, the, in the case of the Gulf Coast, in the case of places like you know, you know, Cancer Alley, uh, can, you, can you speak to that a little bit more? What would you like to see scientifically, what recommendations to us for us to, to review to help really improve that NEPA process and help really improve the cumulative impacts integration into, in, into permitting? I'll stop, thank you. Thank you so much for your questions, Dr. Wilson. Um, yeah, so I think there are a number of things that we need to do. Um, first, the question was about non-attainment and uh, for, for that in particular, um, one of the things that we need to change is, like I said, the attainment, uh, attainment zones are based right now on a year average essentially, and that needs to be proven over a three-year time period. So right now it takes a really long time to prove an area is in non-attainment so when we're evaluating a new project, for example, we don't have the accurate information of what the cumulative impact is right there at that time. So that process, I think, needs to be changed to monitoring on a monthly basis at the very least, um, probably more often would be better. And what we need to have, I think, kind of cycles into some of the rest of your questions about what we would like to see in terms of monitoring. Um, oh, you also asked a question about, about health. And so I wanna come back to that. Um, but in terms of monitoring, what we would want to see is um, a requirement that the companies pay for independent monitoring. So right now the companies report voluntarily uh, their emissions. And if there's a, if there's a problem with their um, reporting, 
they make an amendment, there's no penalty. Um, and so right now we need to change that so that sure, the companies can report their numbers, but we also need to have an independent monitor and we need to have a lot more monitors. So right now there's you know, one number for emissions for the entire plant. We need to have air monitors on every flare stack in every plant. We need to have monitoring sensors at every outfall. We need to have a ton more monitors than we have. And we need to make that data available to the public and to the agencies for evaluation. And then the agencies need to take it up to actually follow up and say, and be evaluating kind of constantly whether or not um, there's a problem. And, and a problem needs to be identified before, you know, three years time. So, so even setting that up so we have some kind of, um, you know, temporal coverage is, is vastly important. Um, I also support the EPA's idea to do um, random spot checks. So I think having routine monitoring that the plants know about is fine as long as there are also random spot checks to where the plants don't know they're coming. In Louisiana, the, the agency is, informs the company when they're coming. So it's, you know, it, what does that do for us in terms of evaluating what people are actually breathing? Um, in, in terms of public health, I think that that is a critical point. Um, in Louisiana and Texas, um, I'm more familiar with the Louisiana data. Uh, we do not have good access um, to public health data um, on, a, on a fine scale. So um, the, the best we can do is, is um, the Louisiana Tumor Registry, which only covers um, cancers and tumors in a certain, it has to be a large enough population block for them to report. So we have a number of public health needs that are absolutely critical that we, and we need to be monitoring people where they live instead of where they get treated. Because in the river parishes in Lake Charles, people will drive, you know, two hours away to go get treatment. And that's where the reporting happens. So instead of the fence line community that they live in showing that there's high cancer rates, it becomes another parish and that's inaccurate. So we need accurate data that's collected by, you know, voluntarily by people that want to share their information and by local clinics and hospitals uh, instead of only a diagnosis. Also, another thing that we could do is uh, be tracking things like um, hospitalization or hospital visits for asthma. Um, we don't have any. We don't have any data on other um, diseases or conditions that occur because of pollution besides cancer. So you know those are still very important. As we know, that's also impacted COVID rates and comorbidities. So we need to be looking at all of those things and have an extensive public health data set that we can also draw from to say, you know, there, there's already a, a high pollution burden. And I know that because I know people in these communities, but it's really hard for me to justify scientifically until I have that data. And it's, that data has been blocked for a very long time. Thank so I you. think- I think oh, those are all the answers. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. I know it's hard to answer briefly. I appreciate these comments and thank you, Dr. Wilson, for your question. Um, yeah, and I know Tom Armitage is probably signaling me to, to try to do a better job timing, but I appreciate the, the comments and the information and the response. Uh, our next speaker is Jessica Ryman Rasmussen from the American Chemistry Council. Please present your comments. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. As mentioned, I am Jessica Ryman Rasmussen. I'm Senior Director of Chemical Management at the American Chemistry Council, ACC. ACC members apply the science of chemistry to make innovative products, technologies, and services that make people's lives better, healthier, and safer. The document, EPA's recommendations for ORD research, states the following regarding cumulative impact assessments, and I quote, 
Fit for purpose assessments consider the extent to which specific types of uncertainty in causality between stressors and receptors can be tolerated. Treating unknown effects of co-exposures to non-chemical stressors as risks, even if causal mechanisms are not fully understood to protect against these unknowns. The above statement minimizes the importance of causality. ACC reminds EPA and the SAB that while cumulative impact assessments may have roots in cumulative environmental impact assessments done under the National Environmental Policy Act or NEPA, the standards for causality in NEPA, TSCA, and other statutes differ greatly. From a risk assessment perspective, one must first establish causality to ensure that valuable time and resources are directed towards actual risks. Requiring that causality first be robustly established for cumulative impact assessments would have three benefits. First, it would aid in prioritizing what should be assessed for cumulative impacts. Second, it would provide a strong foundation for a particular impact to be carried forward for cumulative risk assessment. And third, it would be more in line with the scientific standards of TSCA and other statutes. Like cumulative impact assessments, cumulative risk assessments will assess co-exposures to multiple chemicals and or non-chemical stressors from multiple sources. In order to meet the scientific standards of TSCA and other statutes, it's important that risk be calculated accurately. FASL approaches, such as simply adding together disparate impacts and potential risk factors in ways that are not based on the best available science must be avoided. Also to be avoided are models and methods that are not scientifically accurate. For example, current cumulative risk screening methods employed by EPA include the Risk Screening Environmental Indicators or RSEI model to help identify potential priorities for more in-depth evaluation. However, these models and RSEI in particular do not calculate scientifically accurate levels of actual risks of adverse effects or disease outcomes. In conclusion, it's crucial that high quality research be identified, funded, and conducted. Also, other federal agencies may have valuable information and expertise on non-chemical stressors. All steps in the process must be done with a view to ensuring that EPA's cumulative impact assessments and cumulative risk assessments ultimately meet the scientific standards of TSCA and other statutes, including those for causality. ACC appreciates the opportunity to comment. Thank you so much for these comments. Uh, members, any questions for the speaker? Brief questions. Uh, maybe I could, I don't so much want to ask the question. Could I just make a very brief comment? Dr. That, Smith, go ahead. Um, there is a forthcoming report from the National Academies that was commissioned by EPA that's looking at the issue of causality in EPA assessments, including TOSCA, which you just mentioned. And, um, and, I just wanted to put on the record that that will address many issues of, of causality in EPA studies. I may, uh, may not may not entirely um, respond to your points, but I, I wanted to you know, note that that these issues are under active discussion and there will be a forthcoming report. Thank you, Dr. Smith, for your comment. Uh, and maybe we'll take that in lieu of a question this time. Thank you both. Our next public speaker is T. Tanaka from Stop ETO in Lake County. Please present your comments. Is T. Tanaka with us? Uh, all right, well, we will hold T in the queue for circling back. I will call on our next speaker, which is Laria Edwards, Environmental Defense Fund. Please present your comments. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dr. Lariah Edwards. Uh, thank you for providing EDF the opportunity to provide comments. EDF commends EPA for seeking consultation and how EPA can incorporate cumulative impact assessments into its decision making and on research to strengthen methodologies used for cumulative impact assessments. We strongly encourage the Science Advisory Board to revive the agency with advice on how it can incorporate data, particularly quantitative data for combinations of chemicals and non-chemical stressors into its near-term decision-making. People living in communities are often exposed to multiple chemical and non-chemical stressors. EPA assessments and decision-making should take into consideration the reality and take steps to move away as much as possible from the status quo of one source 
one chemical, one environmental medium, and add an average person to better reflect real conditions. And providing advice to EPA on the applications of cumulative impact assessments that are supported by currently available data and methods, we encourage the SAB to consider the full range of potential applications from supporting regulatory decisions to prioritization and screen activities. Some examples we note are the following. First, enhancing how population vulnerability is quantified in risk assessments through incorporating evidence of effect modification of dose response relationships between pollutant, chemical, and adverse health outcome by non-chemical stressors, such as low SCS status or membership in a population group that has been historically, economically, and socially marginalized. We suggest that you consider analyses supporting the, the lead NACs for good examples of incorporating non-chemical stressors as effective modifiers of the dose response relationships. Specifically, we see C appended C of the supplemental information related to the relationship or uh, related to the human health risk assessment in the external review draft of the 2021 EPA's policy assessment for the reconsideration of the the uh, the NACs for, for NACs and uh, article by Shari at R2012. Another area of opportunity is in assessing health risks for classes and groups of chemicals that impact the same biological targets to inform health-based decisions. This can be done as part of the Toxic Substance Control Act risk evaluations, for example, in the assessment of phthalates. This could build on earlier work from the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission in 2014. Another application would be in the six-year review of the drinking water standards. Uh, C. Evans et al. 2019 for carcinogenic or neurotoxic drinking water contaminants. Finally, the Clean Air Act hazardous air pollutant ri residual risk rules or, or actions for cumulative, act, cumulative risk and impact should be considered. In terms of recommendations for incorporating particular stressors that are frequently present in communities, you recognize this is an area that is more challenging given the lack of consensus on how to do so. Nonetheless, we recommend that the identification include inclusion of stresses that are important to communities be driven by a shared health endpoint. Chemical and non-chemical stressors should be included based on the availability of evidence linking each stressor to a common health endpoint. And we point to numerous data sources such as NHANES, the US Census, Chemical and Product, data, product Database, EJ Screen, as available information to incorporate chemical and non-chemical stressors. This includes our comments from EDF. Thank you so much. Thank you for these comments. Members, any questions for our speaker? It looks like Dr. Beck. I have to unmute myself. Um, first of all, thank you very much, Mariah. I mean, Mariah and I used to work together and I'm delighted to hear from you speaking on behalf of EDF. Um, I did have a question. You referred to a number of examples where the agency has uh, done analyses incorporating understanding of effect modify on effect modification by non-chemical stressors such as with the NACs or with TOSCA. And I was thinking it might be helpful if you could provide a list of those examples to the board. I, I think I personally would like to see those examples because that's one thing that I've been struggling with here is the uh, difficulty in trying to combine chemicals and stressors, which are often characterized with very different metrics. So I'd be very interested in reviewing those examples that you discussed. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Beck. I'd be sh I'll be sure to submit these uh, oral comments to the committee so they can be available to you guys. Thank you, Thank very, you much. very much. Thank you both. Our next speaker is Maya Nye from Coming Clean. Please present your comments. Hello, uh, my name is Maya Nye. I have a PhD in occupational and environmental health sciences, but I also grew up and went to school in the fence line community next to a chemical manufacturing facility that produced carbamic pesticides, along with many other products without sufficient regulations and practices in place to protect me from the time that I was in utero through adulthood. Currently, I am the Federal Policy Director for Coming Clean, which is a network of around 150 organizations guided by the Louisville Charter for Safer Chemicals, which pinpoints addressing cumulative impacts as central to our vision for a health, uh, excuse me, a safe and healthy environment. And um, I wanna submit for the record a policy brief by Drs. Nikki Sheets and Anna Baptista, which include, uh, which highlights some of the ways that cumulative impacts analysis is being translated into policy. I'm putting that in the chat. I know you can't all see it, but hopefully it will be passed along. 
Um, so it's promising to see that EPA is working to move forward cumulative impact assessments. Uh, it's just simply not good science to ignore the reality of how people experience pollution, which is not one chemical at a time or one stressor at a time. And this document really takes a big step in recognizing that. So we want to express support and encouragement for that, as well as some of the other strengths in the document um, that are in line with the Louisville Charter. And that includes um, the distinction between cumulative risk and cumulative impacts, uh, that legacy pollution must be included, and that uh, climate change is a stressor. We also strongly support the recognition that cumulative impacts assessment needs to be participatory and meaningfully integrate community and traditional knowledge. And I, I do kind of want to just take a moment to, to point out the disconnect that, that one of the previous uh, speakers mentioned, that for this document that really focuses pretty heavily on participation, this is way too short of a window for participation in this particular process. And there are a number of other processes happening at the same time that are demanding public input on cumulative impacts. And it's kind of been confusing as a professional to navigate. So I can only imagine how a number of, you know, affected community members whose lives will ultimately be directly impacted by these decisions are made here today. I can understand how confusing that might be for them. So I hope there's a little bit better coordination on that. Um, one challenge I wanted to highlight in this document is that it really misses the opportunity to explicitly ground cumulative impacts in environmental justice priorities. By addressing the needs of environmental justice communities who are most exposed and susceptible, we're protecting everyone. So just in conclusion, um, while the science may be incomplete, now is the time to translate cumulative impacts assessment into regulatory action, permitting, and enforcement, because the science is never going to be perfect. What exists now, it is sufficient for moving forward to protect communities. And as the science evolves through these efforts and other efforts, EPA should adapt um, while being guided by the precautionary principle and seeking to do no harm. So I thank um, all of you for your service on this board. Thank you for these comments. Members, any questions for our speaker? I have my, this is Dr. Florence Anoro. I have my um, speaker unmuted. Uh, I don't really have a question, but I wanted to make a, um, a comment that um, around the nation, uh, the question of cumulative impacts and um, risk has been the resounding um, question and concern. So, um, and I hope that, um, some of the speakers here uh, would at least take the message back that is being uh, uh, that the, the messages and their cries are being heard, and hopefully something will come out of um, uh, this meeting. And um, as she um, stated, uh, translating some of these um, comments and the science and the data into um, regulatory decisions. I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you for your comment, Florence. Dr. Honorio, I'm sorry. Uh, our next speaker is Stephanie Heron, Environmental Justice Health Alliance for Chemical Policy Reform. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Stephanie Heron. I'm the National Organizer for the Environmental Justice Health Alliance for Chemical Policy Reform, or EJHA. EJHA is a national network of grassroots environmental and economic justice groups and advocates in communities that are disproportionately impacted by toxic chemicals from legacy contamination, ongoing exposure to polluting facilities and health harming products or health harming chemicals and household products. EJHA works towards a pollution free economy that leaves no worker or community behind. I do have some substantive comments uh, on EPA's white paper, but first I did wanna make a quick note on process similar to what some other speakers have mentioned. Uh, I'm really blessed to get to do this work as my day job. And yet this meeting, this paper and this process isn't really easy for me to understand and is was a little difficult to access. So I imagine that it's an additional barrier as others have mentioned for unpaid and overworked community members who are participating in a voluntary capacity. Uh, research and assessments like this are really important, but they're important for the sake of protecting people and not just for the sake of having more research, which I know all of you understand. Us. But it's not really clear to me, and we need to understand how this research will translate 
into policy and decision making that will have real impacts in the communities that I work with. Uh, for reference, I'm one of three full-time employees at EJHA, and we are currently engaging with EPA and the White House Council on Environmental Quality on the Risk Management Program rule, the MON rule, NEPA, Justice 40, just to name a few. And there are different good people at these agencies leading all these different efforts for the government, but they're all reaching out to me. <laughs> uh, these advisory boards and these um, different offices and agencies really need to do a better job of coordinating across offices, across rulemakings, because we really do have a limited capacity and honestly, even figuring out which processes will be the most meaningful to engage in can be a bit of a challenge. And there are unfortunately a lot of examples of times where EPA has solicited input on guidance documents or different things that we took a lot of time to weigh in on, but were never implemented or translated into any meaningful results in the communities. It's not easy to attend these kind of meetings, but there are plenty of places where capacity strapped EJ groups are already weighing in on a lot of the concepts that were laid out in the paper that were really commendable as others have mentioned. I would recommend as one practical step that maybe someone from EPA or someone from the Science Advisory Board uh, in order to get feedback from impacted communities who aren't able to attend these meetings, might go through some of the comments in the number of currently open and or recently closed dockets on related issues and see what comments they've made about cumulative impacts there. The cumulative impacts of multiple pollutants combined with other stressors is a really critical issue for EJHA as a number of others have mentioned. There are hundreds or maybe even thousands of studies showing that there are disproportionate impacts on communities of color and on low-income communities. And it's really important to note that these people aren't naturally more vulnerable, but are made more susceptible to health harms by unjust systems and by disparate pollution burdens. And then we need EPA to take action to reduce these burdens. I'm an advocate and an organizer, I'm not a scientist, but I do know that there's no such thing as a scientifically perfect tool or method and this can't be used as an excuse for continuing to fail to protect people. Cumulative impacts are something that we've begun to understand better in the past 10 or so years and hear more about, but it's not a new concept. The first mention I saw of cumulative impacts in policymaking occurred 10 years before I was even born. <laughs> there are plenty of models and examples of states and communities creating tools and policies to address cumulative impacts that EPA can look to as a start and continue to improve over time as they're taking action. I'm not saying that there's no use for EPA to gather more information. I think there were really important points and questions raised in the white paper, but it's important to note that the absence of information is not evidence of the absence of harm. The scientists and the agencies tasked with protecting the public and the environment should take a precautionary approach because you can't go back and unpoison people. I'm here today because the communities that I work with need EPA and need scientists like you to step up to address these issues. We need a commitment to addressing cumulative and disproportionate impacts now, and not in some theoretical future when a perfect assessment method has been created. I'm asking you as scientists, to draw on your knowledge and expertise to help reduce these harmful, unfair, and cumulative burdens. We need you to help EPA figure out practical methods to measure or describe these burdens in ways that can support them taking action to reduce them. As another speaker noted, EPA is still mostly doing risk assessments for single chemicals, and this is insufficient because people aren't exposed only to one chemical at a time or even one source or facility at a time. We need your commitment to create scientifically based methods that are workable and that are based in the actual lived reality and that can support action to protect communities in the near term. I really appreciate that EPA is beginning to grapple with the important questions that were raised in the white paper, but I need to remind you that this isn't a rhetorical or scientific exercise. EJ communities are made up of real people whose health and families are on the line. I strongly urge you and EPA to meaningfully and proactively engage with communities, being mindful of their real world capacity as you do this work. 
community members are experts. They're experts in their experience, they're experts in their needs and their solutions. I believe that all of you joined this advisory board because you genuinely really care about science and about protecting people and the environment. And I appreciate that. And I need you to know that this isn't an exercise about methods or research for the sake of research. Our communities don't have the luxury not to live next to polluting facilities or to be exposed to one facility or chemical at a time. And we don't have the luxury to not live in a changing climate. We live in the real world and that world is putting our people in danger every day. And we need EPA rules and regulations that address that real lived reality. Thank you for your consideration and for your service on this science advisory board. Thank you for your comments. Members, any quick questions for our speaker? All right, I think we will move to our next speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have three more speakers. We have, I'll give you the order so that folks can be ready. We have uh, Amalia Nito Gomez, we have Uni Blake, and we have Kaylee Shoup. Amalia Nito Gomez from Alliance of the Southeast. You're our next speaker. Please present your comments. Hello, uh, my name is Amalia Nieto Gomez. I'm the executive director for the Alliance of the Southeast and also staff the Coalition for South Park CBA. Um, I'm from the Southeast uh, side of Chicago um, and we have been involved in the Stop General Iron Coalition in efforts to deny the permit for General Iron um, which is a toxic company uh, that was moving from a majority white neighborhood, more affluent neighborhood to an overburdened, well-documented overburdened minority community. Um, the city uh, did decide to deny the permit um, on February 18th, but it took three and a half years of organizing efforts from across the community and even support across the US to get that done. Um, we have participated in the health impact assessments for RMG and the General Iron, we are dealing with climate uh, change with the confined disposal facility um, because it's on the lake and there are rising lake levels for that. Um, we have a long experience of trying to not only fight toxic uh, developments in our community, uh, but also um, trying to make sure that the developments that do come actually benefit community members. So it's with this context that I would like to present my comments um, mostly focusing on addressing some of the scientific concerns and then also the um, stakeholder engagement and empowering local decisions and actions. So for addressing scientific considerations, um, you need to take into account net uh, environmental health burdens. Um, need to take into account land, water, and air pollution in the area where a development is being proposed. You also need to take into account different types of pollutions and toxins. We live in a community that has legacies from many steel uh, companies um, from the turn of the century, which existed before the EPA. And so there's a lot of toxins already in the area, um, in the land, water, and air. Um, because of this, uh, we don't want to just look at the permits um, one by one by one, but it needs to take into the whole purpose of this is the cumulative impact. So I also need to take into account the different types of pollutants and toxins such as PM 2.5, PM 10, manganese, lead, and arsenic. And there should be a range of impacts that are considered that are not just conservative uh, health impacts, but average or likely uh, impacts, and then what would the upper range be? We recently had a health impact assessment for General Iron and the only scientific data that was presented was the health impacts and the company repeatedly said it was a conservative estimate. And of course, in that conservative estimate, none of the toxins exceeded EPA guidelines. Air monitors, um, which are also mentioned in some of the, um, the draft report, um, should have base readings from both um, disproportionately impacted and overburdened communities, but also in uh, communities that do not have a history of toxic um, and heavily air pollution in their communities so that there can be a ready base reading. Again, in our health impact assessment in Chicago, it was only taken, the comparison was between air monitors in comparatively disproportionately burdened communities. And so, our, airport, our 
burden was in that context. And so we were, since we were not the top of the communities that were most heavily burdened, which were the ones with the air monitors. Amalia, excuse me, you're, you're at time. So if you could make a closing comment, that would be helpful. Thank you. Okay. So um, I would also say for empowering local and uh, decisions and actions need to take into account community input, testimony, research, and have the community help set priorities and the context for the process. The health impact assessment, um, the community needs to be involved in the planning context and outcomes and accepting community comments. Um, need to give standing to communities in the decision-making process. And the rulemaking process should incorporate the company's history, violations, citations, area pollution and toxins, disparate impacts, and also give the community standing in the permitting process, not just the company that's applying and the, EP, and the uh, state EPA. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Members, any questions for our speaker? Thank you. Seeing none, I'll move to Uni Blake from the American Petroleum Institute. You may present your comments. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. So thank you members of the SAB and to the EPA for hosting this meeting. My name as said was Uni Blake. I'm a senior policy advisor here at the American Petroleum Institute. So API is the only national trade association representing all facets of the oil and natural gas industry. As a result, our members are affected by all of EPA's activities, both directly as companies subject to regulation and indirectly as downstream customers of regulated companies. Well, to begin, we appreciate EPA's recognition of the challenges associated with assessing cumulative impacts. Um, ORD defines cumulative impacts as a total burn burden, which includes positive, neutral, and negative interactions. So EPA's approaches have typically focused on negative interactions, such as assessing a community's risks or potential for adverse health out outcomes. And we recognize these and appreciate them as it as important and this approach is important as well. However, we're asking the agency to take a holistic approach and also consider resiliency factors in cumulative assessments. For example, just a quick example, a new and existing facility can result in um, workforce development and economic investment. They are factors, um, resiliency factors that can be um, incorporated here that include changes in local employment rates or changes in income you know, in inequality, um, creating a more resilient community. So if the goal of the cumulative assessment is to improve a community's health and quality of life, um, perhaps a good starting point may be um, looking at public health models. Public health models are typically fit for purpose. They rely on site-specific conditions and factors to establish effective intervention and approaches. For example, the social ecological model can conceptualize a community's vulnerability as well as resilience by looking at the interplay between the individual, social institution and policy factors to develop a site-specific assessment and site-specific responses. This approach can identify critical interactions that require interventions to improve resilience and also reduce vulnerabilities. Creating a score to represent the total burden we're beginning to understand is a challenge, especially without a standardized approach for comparing factors across the different interactions. This could potentially mean exploring or developing generic measures of disease burden. There may also be value in exploring weighting. Weighting can help determine the relative importance of an indicators of contribution to a community's resilience or vulnerability, therefore leading to prioritization of resources and interventions. However, weighting and scoring need to be grounded in sound science. We appreciate the agency's thoughtful and systematic approach to addressing cumulative impacts. As an industry that has a history of working in and, in, and with the communities where we located and operate, we look forward to working with the agency to develop methods that are supported by sound scientific principles. Again, thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much for your comments. Are there any questions for our speaker? Uh, Dr. Beck. Dr. Beck, you might be on mute. 
Yeah, I unmuted. Um, Dr. Blake, thank you very much for those comments. And it, it made me think of some of the earlier comments of Dr. Edwards. And, you know, as I said earlier, it's a, I've really been struggling with what kind of models are available to integrate these different types of stressors, the chemical stressors and the more uh, social public health stressors. And uh, so to the extent that you can provide information on those models that you had described earlier, I think that um, I would find that very helpful. So if you can provide those references to the SAB officers, I think that would be very useful. Thank okay, you. thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Wilson, I usually only take one question, but it was quick from Barbara, so I don't go quickly. If you yeah, do it quickly. I was, that's what I was wondering. <laughs> so that's why I chimed in, because I'm new to this. I know my talkers. I'm a, I appreciate the, the comments about the, the site assessment. Uh, I also appreciate the comments about the social ecology model. I think that's a, that's a good approach. And, and, I, and I like the comment about the, you know, thinking about benefits in general. Uh, resiliency, I think we have to talk about that more because I think some of the other panels would say that resiliency is kind of a, it's not probably not the best term, but I think as part of the cumulative impact assessment, understanding the ecological, social, economic, environmental benefits will, will be useful uh, to, to, to model those things. And I think the EPA has done some work with the screen tools and as other states are doing work with screen tools that get, gets us to that down the road. So I just wanted to, to kind of chime in on that comment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Appreciate the comment. All right, we've reached our, our final speaker. Uh, it is Kaylee Shoup from Citizens Caring for the Future. And if any of our, we had two earlier speakers that did not um, appear. And so you could, in the chat, you could alert uh, me if you have joined the call, but I don't see you on the participant list. So Kaylee Shoup, please, the floor is yours. Please present your comments. Hello, my name is Kaylee Shoup and I'm a community organizer with a small grassroots group called Citizens Caring for the Future. I grew up in and currently live in the heart of the Permian Basin in a small town in New Mexico called Carlsbad. I have seen my community change in countless negative ways since the introduction of fracking to our region, which has made the Permian the most productive oil field in the country, the second most productive oil field in the world, and the number one source of methane pollution in the United States. Along with planet warming methane pollution comes dangerous air toxins such as benzene, ethylbenzene, toluene, and xylene, which are not required to be regulated under the Clean Air Act. Not all bad air quality is created equal, and sadly, some of the most toxic air is overlooked in our country. This oversight has dire consequences for the health of frontline communities like mine that are exposed to these toxins daily. Because the Permian is a complex exposure environment, the harm to our health in frontline communities is often underestimated and overlooked. In cumulative impact assessments, the risk of daily exposure to these carcinogenic toxins must not be downplayed and more study must go into monitoring these toxins. Citizens Care for the Future is currently working with the New Mexico Environment Department to acquire funding to install a monitor that will track the BTEC suite of pollutants in Eddy County. Monitoring such as this must be expanded throughout the country and the data acquired must be taken into consideration during cumulative impact assessments. Another issue in my region that deserves much more attention and study is the issue of produced water. Specifically, the fact that produced water has radioactive components along with being treated with PFAs and unknown chemicals. The threat to health that being surrounded by this water poses must be quantified in a more meaningful way. While making sure the water sources do not become contaminated is important, other factors must also be taken into account. There is virtually no enforcement of regulation done in the Permian, which means illegal dumping of produced water and daily unreported spills is par for the course. I cannot tell you how many times I have driven behind a produced water truck in the middle of town with an open spigot dumping produced water onto the roads. This bleak reality must be considered while deciding if an overburdened community can be saddled with even more harmful sites and projects. Last but not least, the Southeast New Mexico portion of the Permian is also home to the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, which is a permanent disposal site for low level nuclear waste and is likely to pivot to high level nuclear waste in the future. Along with WIP, we also are home to the proposed Holtec site, which will be a temporary storage facility for the entire nation's high level nuclear waste. This waste is proposed to be stored above ground and will pose even more risk to my region. How the nuclear and oil industry interact in the Permian must be studied further if the nation continues to rely on my community as a nuclear dump site. Thank you so much for your work on these important issues and for taking the time to consider the lived realities of those of us, or those of us that are most affected by environmental pollution. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for these comments. Members, questions or comments for our speaker? Dr. Wilson, your hand might be up from previously, but if you put it up newly, please, please go ahead. Sorry. That's all right. All right, I believe we reached the end of our speakers and really appreciate all of these comments on behalf of the board. Thank you so much. Public comment period is so important to us. All right, the next item on our agenda is a consultation with EPA on research needed to improve the state of science supporting cumulative impact assessments. Dr. Chris Frey, Deputy Assistant Administrator in EPA's Office of Research and Development is going to offer us opening remarks. Go ahead, Dr. Frey. Uh, thanks, Dr. Cullen, and uh, thank you to members of the Science Advisory Board for taking time today and next week to hold these public meetings. Having served on the SAB myself for six years, I know there's a lot of prep and follow-up work in addition to the meeting itself. I also want to second uh, the Deputy Administrator's acknowledgement of the new Standing Committees on Climate Change and Environmental Justice Science. Uh, we need your expertise in these committees, all the standing committees and the full board to assure that the agency is using the best available science to address uh, these and other priorities. I'm here to introduce the EPA presentation on cumulative impact assessment, but I just wanted to say a few words about the Monday release of the, the memorandum issued at the direction of the administrator regarding SAB's role in reviewing science that supports EPA decisions. This administration is committed to the role of science to inform decision-making, and the memo ensures that the science EPA relies on in its rulemaking is reviewed according to well-established time-tested processes, and that peer review is done by engaging with independent external experts in a timely and rigorous manner, and that's you. Um, On to the cumulative impacts presentation. So President Biden has made clear that climate change and environmental justice are among this administration's top priorities. And the administrator has made clear that these are the agency's top priorities. The agency has engaged extensively with partners and stakeholders in uh, many discussions leading up to uh, what we are bringing before you today. And these discussions have consistently brought us back to the way that health, well-being, and um, uh, community resilience or, or other status, as, as Dr. Wilson was alluding to, in the face of threats such as climate change um, and, and the historical burdens that many communities have faced, are impacted by combinations of pollutants and social stressors that we're exposed to throughout our lifetime. And this general concept known as cumulative impacts has, at least in our interactions with with experts and members of communities, has been referred to uh, by some as the holy grail of environmental justice, uh, at least in terms of the science to support decisions uh, at advancing environmental justice. Progress in understanding and addressing cumulative impacts is key to making significant progress in reducing environmental health inequities in our country. And your input through this consultation will be critical to how EPA thinks about cumulative impacts in its research and decision-making. I think this will be a good time to queue up the slides for EPA's presentation, because I'd like to refer to um, the second slide. Thank you. Um, So, uh, and I have to clear off my screen so I can see it. Okay. So, um, as, as you, uh, I think as you know, ORD, the Office of Research and Development has published an external review draft of a document that we're calling Cumulative Impacts Recommendations for ORD Research. Uh, this was published last month when this public meeting was announced. And in the following presentations, we will give background and context as to the path by which EPA got to where it currently is and how we're currently thinking about moving forward to address cumulative impacts. These presentations will begin at the national level, uh, focusing on regulatory decisions, and then we'll turn to look at local decisions, followed by an overview of the cumulative impacts report itself. Um, Next slide, please. So the next uh, hour or so will involve three presentations. The first will be provided by Drs. Ann Wolverton and Chris Dawkins, of the National Center for Environmental Economics in the Office of Policy. And 
The second presentation will be given by Dr. Tim Barzik, who is a leading expert in ORD uh, regarding health impact assessment. And then finally, Susan Julius, who is co-chair of ORD's Cumulative Impacts work group, will give an overview of the Cumulative Impacts uh, paper that, that you have a copy of. Um, we greatly appreciate the high level of engagement of SAB members. Um, we've seen the extensive pre-meeting written comments. Uh, we're also thankful to the members of the public who have provided uh, both oral and written comments today. And we look forward to and welcome um, your further input today via the discussion today and then your post-meeting final written comments. Uh, so I thank you. And uh, I guess, Allison, with your permission, I will hand this over to, uh, to Ann and Chris for the first presentation. Thank you, Dr. Frey. And you introduced the speakers for me, which was very nice. I appreciate that. Uh, just for the members of the board, uh, we will hear these three presentations and then we will discuss responses to EPA's charge questions on the topic. Uh, we have the preliminary written comments and we will go through the charge questions in order and discuss each one. I would like to call on Drs. Wolverton and Dawkins to begin their presentation on application of cumulative impact assessment to national and regional scale decision-making. Okay, very good. Thank you uh, very much. I'm Chris Dawkins with the uh, EPA's National Center for Environmental Economics. Um, I'm an economist. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I'm an economist, not a risk assessor. I just want to say uh, as we move on that um, I'm going to go relatively quickly because, of course, um, and the most valuable thing, obviously, is, is, he is hearing from you all and hearing from the public comments. So it's time well spent, but I'm going to go um, relatively quickly. Um, and I also want to say I recognize uh, some, probably most of you, know much about this already. Many of you truly know more about the science of risk assessment than I as a consumer. But we thought it'd be useful to um, ensure we have a common baseline understanding of these things and place it in the context of, of rulemaking, of national rulemaking. So... Ah, yes, thank you for advancing the slides. Okay, just a, a short definition of risk assessment. Um, the, we're trying to characterize the adverse health effects of human exposures. Um, it's, many of you know these things already, but EPA has extensive guidance for risk assessment. Uh, there's a framework, and when I say risk assessment, human health risk assessment. Um, guidelines for carcinogen in risk assessment. Um, um, it's, uh, extensive guidance. Um, it is worth pointing out, as many has come up um, before, that usually this is done one chemical or contaminant at a time, especially for regulatory, um, for, uh, for, um, for regulatory analyses and, and regular decisions. It's also worth pointing out that um, risk assessments that inform these decisions are really highly rigorous, right? It's an often time and resource intensive um, with peer review opportunities for public comment. One more stage is this is, it give you a sense of that, this is the, um, graphic from the uh, draft IRIS handbook that was out for public comment last year, just to get a sense of uh, what's involved. Next slide, please. So um, this is the familiar um, four-step uh, risk assessment paradigm that is originally described in the 1983 NAS report, the Red Book, and since reaffirmed um, many times. It may be worth noting here that these steps of hazard identification, dose response assessment. Um, they're performed often by the uh, IRIS program in ORD, but also by some program offices. So we'll be, that'll be done uh, in multiple places um, within the agency. When it comes to exposure assessment and the risk characterization, those steps are primarily performed uh, by the program offices that needed for specific regulatory uh, decisions. Next slide, please. Just briefly, the, from the framework of human health um, risk assessment, the 2014 framework document lists several examples of you know, EPA actions that are informed by um, a human health risk assessment. Um, but in fact, almost all decisions that the agency is making that affect human health are grounded in or informed by um, a human health risk assessment. Our focus is regulatory decision making here. Next slide, please. So uh, obviously um, risk assessment can answer a whole array of questions or there are a wide array of questions that we want it to answer. Um, but there are barriers to actually being able to answer um, all these. We're gonna highlight a few of these. 
circled in green here is sort of the primary questions um, for risk assessment is typically done. You know, does the stressor cause harm? And then what's the relationship between exposure and harm? And we drop on the kind of input um, you can see here, animal studies, controlled human epi epidemiological studies, and um, mechanistic studies um, to all uh, inform those questions. And then there are these second two examples that are, that are sets of key questions, um, which what we're focusing on more today. And um, we'll hear more about that through the presentation, but it brings in these questions of uh, interactions and effect modification data. Next slide, please. Um, so the framework, the 2014 framework described the importance of uh, EPA risk assessments being fit for purpose following um, uh, discussion in the science and decisions um, NAS report. But the meaning that the risk assessment answers specific questions it needs to answer for a risk management decision. Um, and while the general framework and nature of the assessments follow the paradigm described earlier, specific needs can vary by statute and specific processes can vary by statute. You can see with the National Ambient Air Quality Standards, um, they have a uh, specific process under TSCA, specific processes. Um, for regulatory analysis, extensive human day is particularly informative in part because we can get a dose or concentration response function often. It's in the species of interest, which reduces some uncertainty, um, often in the relevant exposure range. But, and we, we have these data sometimes for things like uh, particulates, lead, some other metals, um, some other chemicals, but that kind of data rich environment is the exception. Many of our assessments, especially for chemicals, um, have to rely upon animal data and um, also outside of cancer risk assessments, for example, we generally won't have dose response functions in the relevant range for human exposures. Next slide, please. Relating this um, a little bit to regulatory analysis and the role that this speaking broadly, right? This isn't uh, any program uh, specific information here, but um, risk assessments can inform the regulatory analysis in a many different ways, but we'll look at sort of three broad categories here. One is very early on in the process, identifying regulatory options. The exposure response relationships, for example, can suggest ways to mitigate specific uh, uh, exposures and you know, provide information to help, for example, determine whether it's feasible to reduce risks to a given level. Um, then through the regulatory process, um, we use these risk assessments to estimate the effects of different regulatory options. Perhaps directly looking at the second bullet, how risk changes for different groups by option, but also um, through additional regulatory analyses, benefit cost analysis, for example, we wanna look at those um, risk reductions and try to determine the economic value of um, reductions in incidents or reductions in individual risk using information on people's willingness to pay to, um, to reduce such risks. And then for EJ analyses, um, we'll also use risk assessment as a, as a, as a critical input to the extent we can. Um, and then finally, it'll feed into the risk management portion in the third column so that where do options meet specific risk targets? Do we need to revisit the decision to make it more conservative, um, for example? And it's gonna be important to characterize the uncertainties and data limitations. When, uh, for the decision makers, the risk managers in that step. Next slide, thank you. Um, just as a, as a quick example for say benefits analysis, where we have uh, epi data, for example, and we have some sort of dose or concentration response function, we might be able to use a, a derived health impact function for that. That would, uh, um, that would include baseline incidence, and effect estimate, um, and then the changes in concentration from a given policy or policy option. Um, and once we factor in the exposed population, we can get some change in incidence and from there, calculate um, economic benefits analysis, my, uh, my job, but you know, also provide that information directly for, um, for different uh, policy options. I'm gonna turn it over to Ann Wolverton now. Um, 
Great, thanks, Chris. And you can advance the slide. And my voice is, I've been losing my voice all week. So my apologies about that. So <clears throat> Chris talked about the way in which we typically approach risk assessment for rules. And so a key question in the regulatory context is where do cumulative concerns then fit in? And I think we heard from a lot of speakers today giving a, a very strong um, you know, reason why we would be concerned for that. So we've got this kind of typical risk assessment process that often focuses on single chemicals or stressors, but we recognize the importance of trying to consider more holistically the other chemical and non-chemical stressors that are playing a role in these communities to both better characterize pre-existing vulnerabilities and then in the regulatory context when thinking about a rule to understand and assess the added or incremental effects of changes in a particular pollutant under consideration and the way it might interact with those pre-existing vulnerabilities already in overburdened communities. Of course, we wanted to do this using whatever data we can leverage in the most robust scientific way. Please advance the slide. So <clears throat> I thought that um, this definition of vulnerability is helpful for understanding very um, in, in a more explicit way, the way that we might connect uh, what the job of risk assessment is to what we're attempting to do in other parts of the analysis, in particular environmental justice analysis. This is a World Health Organization definition, but it also appears in our environmental justice technical guidelines for the agency. And so in particular, you can see these bolded parts of the definition that kind of call on a number of um, pieces that we've already um, talked about at least generally in that four sets of risk assessment questions that Chris mentioned earlier. One is that there's a whole host of factors, physical, chemical, biological, social, and cultural factors, right, that are affecting communities and different populations that then make them more susceptible to environmental factors. <clears throat> this can be because of greater exposure to those factors and, and or in combination, a compromised ability to cope with and or recover from those exposures. And so that, that's a really, I think, the crux of what we're basically trying to get at. Next slide, please. I mentioned the environmental justice technical guidelines or guidance document. I wanted to um, let folks know that this document has been, um, it was reviewed by the SAB and um, uh, put out in 2016. And it broadly guides the approach that risk assessors and economists take to evaluating EJ concerns for regulations of which risk assessment and economic analysis are both really important inputs. And there are three questions that analysts are attempting to answer in an EJ analysis. These are kind of wordy questions because they're meant to apply to a variety of different contexts and program offices. But what they boil down to is trying to get at the baseline, which is what does the world look like before we regulate it or um, you know, put a new regulation in place? That's really getting at that pre-existing um, vulnerabilities piece. Um, and in particular, associated with the environmental stressors affected by the regulatory action, but you can think of that as being, being broader than just the specific pollutant at play. And then within a regulation or a regulatory action, we want to think about that same question for each of the regulatory options. And then finally, we want to make a comparison between those two to understand whether there are potential EJ concerns newly created or exacerbated or potentially mitigated by certain options relative to others uh, compared to the baseline. Next slide. <clears throat> so um, we have to kind of understand what that means. I've got a list here of some of the things we might think about in the baseline, as well as when thinking about the regulatory options or the rule. And <clears throat> there's a parallel to some extent between them. So in the baseline, we want to know what's the likely magnitude of risks, exposures, or health effects before we put any sort of new policy or regulation in place, and whether those baseline risks, exposures, or health effects are higher or concentrated for particular types of populations. Uh, it's hidden on the slide for some reason, but the, the third point is to the extent to which multiple chemical or non-chemical stressors are then contributing to that pre-existing concern. When you think about then layering on a new policy action or regulation, you're asking 
kind of similar sets of questions, but you're trying, you're focusing on the change. So what's the likely magnitude of change, the, the change in the risk exposure or health effects? And does that vary across the options? To what extent are those changes concentrated for in particular populations of concern or communities? Are there unique exposures or vulnerabilities we should be paying attention to? And to what extent are these being layered on top of or part of a larger cumulative concern? Next slide. <laughs> so um, that harkens back then or circles back to those latter two questions on the slide that Chris presented earlier, right? In order to be able to integrate this cumulative piece into the other pieces of the regulatory analysis, we need to be able to say something about the exposure response relationship and to what extent it varies by some of these other factors. <clears throat> and we need to be able to think about and account for potential co-exposures. And you'll see that the inputs that are listed here are in many respects very similar types of studies as we leverage for those first two questions that are typically answered or the focus of traditional risk assessment. But in addition, we need to have some data on the interactions and the effect modifications. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Chris. All right, thank you, Anne. So as we start to turn to, um, given the needs to think um, more cumulatively or think more about um, co-exposures, um, it is worth pointing out that you know, while EPA, we've made strides in accounting for um, uh, some, some kinds of susceptibility, for example, by life stage and risk assessment, um, often we're not evaluating risks cumulatively as has come up uh, many times in, in the discussion so far. And with, while there are exceptions, um, as some of the public commenters even noted, often we just don't have the data and methodology to account for how those exposure response relationships vary with other factors and particularly uh, including socioeconomic uh, factors. Um, so sometimes that's a data issue. We lack modification data for um, many, if not most regulated chemicals. And even when we have um, epi data, we can lack the methods to infer those modifying effects. One thing that it's worth um, considering in the um, national context or the national rulemaking context is that the methods and data available in that context may differ from approaches taken at a local scale. For example, we may have detailed data on specific pathways or specific location, um, but we may not have that nationally, or we can't you know, even extrapolate to a national context. So um, there will be some data differences there. Um, we said we don't do cumulative risk set, which isn't, of course, true. It is um, done and, and sometimes used in regulatory analysis or some analyses that are, um, are cumulative in nature, but it is mostly limited to chemical mixtures and or single chemicals from multiple sources. Here are some, um, some examples. Um, the cumulative impact assessment yeah, uh, has yet to be used. Advance the slide oh, I'm thank you. Could you please advance the slide? Thank you. I apologize for that. Um, so here, here's what I say with those examples. Um, the cumulative impact assessment is yet to be used um, in, regular, in a regulatory analysis. Next slide, please. Um, just a, a final a couple of points. Um, accounting for co-exposures um, is difficult even in a, a chemical context, right? But simply aggregating um, individual risks uh, uh, from different from two different chemicals can um, give you a biased uh, or you know misleading uh, estimate of total risk. You know, here's an example where the two chemicals are synergistic. Um, the chemicals could likewise be antagonistic, so they're less toxic in the presence of each other. And it's even more challenging with trying to account for these interactions between chemical and non-chemical stressors. Next slide, this is the final slide before we turn to Tim. Um, so this, from our EJ technical guidance, um, it does emphasize, you know, to the extent possible to um, evaluate potential EJ concerns and integrate that into the risk assessment rather than as an add-on or separate analysis. Um, 
which we'd very much like to do. So some of the questions for today, besides uh, obviously the charge questions, so what can we do in the face of these data challenges and uncertainty to account for co-exposures? One is what else can we do now, especially keeping in mind the national sort of regulatory context, what can we do in that context? And then what new approaches can we develop going forward? And of course the ORD white paper um, uh, goes into more detail there. It's finally, while all the approaches EPA uses in its technical work should absolutely be grounded in good science, um, for regulatory analyses that support rulemaking, it's particularly important that the approaches we use are scientifically defensible. Um, with that said, I can turn it over to you, Tim. Yeah, thanks, Drs. Wilverton and Dawkins. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Tim Barsick from EPA's ORD. And I think you're ready to roll. There it is, there's the slide. Yeah, thank you. Stay on this slide, please, uh, for the moment. And hello, everyone. I'd like to thank the members of the SAB for their feedback on this work. I'd like to especially thank all the people, the members of the public and the community representatives who have taken time from their day to join us. This work is about real people. It's about the lives they live on a daily basis, the impacts they face from environmental burdens within the context of their lived experience of everything else going on around them, social, economic, and environmental. My name is Tim Barzik, and I have about 15 minutes to go through these slides. I hope to speak today, not just with my voice as an EPA scientist, but with the voices of the community residents and organizers with whom I've had the pleasure and honor to work over the years. Next slide, please. I'd like to draw your attention to the graphic on the right. This admittedly oversimplified image represents decades of social, environmental, and economic decisions that have concentrated people of color and pollution into the same heavily impacted areas driven by programs and policies across sectors from zoning laws and enforcement codes to redlining and lending practices. And throughout time, these same community residents have been largely excluded from the decision-making process due to racial and ethnic biases, even though they represent the most impacted populations. These decisions on the environment, on housing, education, and other factors have led to the snapshot of conditions that we see today and current programs and policies that are based on this historical framework disregard many of the impacts for which no one is held accountable. And this is one of the reasons we're meeting today. To account for environmental burden and all its related impacts as an integral part of one's lived experience, as part of their lives, while acknowledging the challenge of overcoming the historical forces that have gotten us where we are today, and the current decisions that are keeping us here. In this way, we can try to dismantle the problem based on how it was formed. And in this particular example, with an acknowledgement to the racial drivers that motivated some of the decisions. Next slide. While EPA regulated pollutants are a concern for communities, the existing programs and policies typically count for a few pollutants in a smokestack or the water discharge from one facility independent of others, or the soil contamination on one parcel of land. However, there are many chemicals, many smokestacks, water discharges, and contaminated parcels surrounding or within a community that are not captured within these single source, single pollutant scenarios. In addition, these environmental sources impact much more than air, water, and soil quality. The effects of industrialization and deindustrialization contribute to blight, noise, light pollution, fires, explosions, toxic flooding, food degradation, community disenfranchisement, brownfields, and a host of other stressors. While the sources of these impacts may also provide jobs or tax revenue or a service, many of which are considered positive impacts, these benefits rarely flow to the community or offset the burdens that are imposed. And these impacts are associated with physical and mental health endpoints, from asthma and cancer to stress and mental health. So while env environmental sources contribute to cumulative impacts, we also should consider the everyday lived experiences of the people in these communities, the day-to-day -day exposures to all the other physical, social, and economic stressors that could affect their resiliency to environmental exposures. 
And it's this confluence of environmental burden and lived experience that contributes to the environmental injustices witnessed in many black and brown communities across the country. Next slide. As mentioned, when you look at the range of impacts that environmental sources produce, it's natural to consider the programs and policies that might address them. It turns out that there are a range of federal, state, city, and county programs and policies from federal standards to state level enforcement and compliance to city and county permitting actions. And while some states like New Jersey, Minnesota, and California have worked to adopt cumulative impacts more directly, as a whole, federal, state, and local programs are not coordinated to address them. Some programs like the National Environmental Policy Act and some local permitting actions may offer some leeway in terms of discretionary decision-making, but a further review of existing programs and policies at these different federal, uh, state, and local scales would help elucidate which options currently exist to better consider cumulative impacts so that we might act more immediately in the short term. Next slide. So what can be done? What actions can be taken to address cumulative impacts? How can we consider the cumulative impacts of environmental sources as well as the baseline conditions of the impacted community, especially in terms of making environmental decisions? And what would real change perceptible in people's everyday lives really look like? Well, this process of health impact assessment or HIA has provided some insights. HIA is a step-by-step -step methodology that describes the many and varied impacts of a proposed program policy or decision. HIA relies on engagement with all the stakeholders involved in a decision, especially the community. And while health endpoints like the ones listed here, such as asthma, cancer, or diabetes, could be considered an impact themselves, they can also be thought of as an endpoint. Something has to happen first before the health effect is felt. So HIA calls these impacts health determinants, things that determine the course of a health outcome. HIA examines the health determinants or impacts of a decision, such as the siting of an industrial facility. It also takes into account the existing conditions within the surrounding community across a range of factors that might influence their health response to the decision. So by providing that baseline, the HIA then provides strategies and recommendations to help offset those impacts and disrupt the exposure response pathways. Next slide, please. So EPA has conducted some HIAs and learned a lot. I've, I've been working on cumulative assessments in some form or another for most of my career, but really only learned about HIAs in the last few years. And then in 2020, I worked on one with the city of Rockford and representatives from the EPA region five and the EPA office of brownfields and land revitalization. Our opportunities at the time for community outreach and engagement were very limited. Instead, we conducted focus groups with community organizers and drew information from prior community meetings where residents had expressed concerns about local issues. Our city partners were also very strong community advocates. Rockford was interested in large scale neighborhood revitalization efforts, including remediation and reinvestment activities in the local neighborhood. While these activities were bound to have positive impacts on community health, there was also the potential for negative impacts such as gentrification or a misalignment with local values. We looked across six impacts or health determinants that neighborhood revitalization might influence, including housing, neighborhood and built environment, parks and green space, employment and economy, crime and safety, and social and cultural well-being. And since mental health was a priority for both the residents and the city, each of these impacts was viewed through a mental health lens. We collected quantitative, semi-quantitative, and qualitative data on all these determinants and developed 81 strategies to maximize their benefits and minimize their burdens, which is one of the goals of HIA. The city has been highly receptive to these strategies and we're currently exploring their applications to decision-making. 
which means we're moving into one of the most important stages of the HIA process, which is monitoring the effects of the decisions on public health. Next slide, please. HIA is a valuable tool. It provided discrete steps to engage stakeholders, plan the project, collect data, develop recommendations, communicate effectively, and monitor success. But it's not a panacea to cumulative impacts. Solutions and actions may be proposed during an HIA, but it's up to the partners to follow through. A survey of HIAs has shown that when decision makers are involved in the process, HIAs can provide a venue to bring people together and develop mutually beneficial solutions. I'd like to point out two features of HIA to consider with respect to cumulative impact assessment. One is the common sense use of data and information. Sometimes we get so wrapped up in quantitative estimates of risk that we overlook the indicators and anecdotes that can also inform decisions. HIA allows the use of all types of information so long as it relates to the decision and impacts under investigation, allowing, for example, indicators of employment or green space or personal stories about health impacts or perceptions of risk. And I'd add that this can all be done within scientific methods. Cumulative impact assessment could consider the same flexibility in the use of information. However, HIAs typically focus on a proposed decision, something that hasn't occurred yet. We know that cumulative impacts exist right now. While maximizing benefits and minimizing burden is a worthy goal, it may not mean much to plant a few extra trees around an existing facility or to renew a permit for cleaner emissions of one factory in a field of factories or for example, the siting of a modern state-of-the-art facility in an already heavily impacted area, especially if its benefits are not flowing to the community, may be viewed as just another burden and just another example of their disinvestment from the decision-making process. Because history and current decisions have concentrated people of color and pollution into the same places, minimizing burden while still commendable does not necessarily address the removal or redistribution of the sources and their impacts, which is the crux of environmental justice. Next slide, please. Oh, I'm at, actually, can you go back a slide? I think I'm one behind, thank you. So when it comes to informing decisions, uh, we're actually quite data rich and information rich. We have screening tools, online data sets, portable sensors, local scale computer models. So the challenges listed here, I think I'm sorry, could you go to the next slide? That was correct, I'm apologizing. So when it comes to informing decisions, we are actually quite data rich. Uh, we have screening tools, online data sets, portable sensors and local scale computer models. So the challenges listed here are not so much about tools and data, but about the process of addressing cumulative impacts, especially in this particular case, within the existing purview of the EPA and with an eye toward the future, when perhaps programs and policies could be developed that both mitigate and redistribute the impacts on affected communities. Currently, federal, state, and local decisions manifest differently in different communities based on their historical drivers and their current circumstances, so while these blanket programs and policies may treat each environmental source the same, the environmental sources will impact each community differently. Cumulative impact assessment does not have to rely on a single risk estimate to initiate action. So we will have to develop best practices to establish thresholds for action based on meaningful representative data. In the near term, Minimizing impacts and maximizing benefits is still a worthy goal, but cumulative impact assessment should also address distributional inequalities that contribute to environmental injustices. Current avenues may be limited to directly address cumulative impacts. If we take a lesson from HIA, then we can examine some of the most impactful programs and policies and then choose one or a few, such as permitting or revitalization, and work together with federal, state, local, and community partners 
to address the cumulative impacts of that issue. At the same time, develop a framework for a coordinated network of federal, state, and local actions designed to dismantle some of the decisions that got us here in the first place. Finally, I'd like to mention that this example uh, of industrialization and communities of color is not unique. There are hundreds, if not thousands of communities facing this situation. Tribal nations are facing cumulative impacts. Rural communities are facing them with things like concentrated animal feeding operations or mountaintop mining. There are coastal and port communities faced with expanding industry and climate change. Perhaps EPA can help facilitate this dialogue, working together with communities, state and local partners to guide decisions that address cumulative impacts while acknowledging the lived experiences of the most impacted populations. Thank you very much for your time and attention for the opportunity for me to speak here today. Thank you, Dr. Barzik for your presentation. Uh, our final presentation from EPA is Ms. Susan Julius from also ORD. Uh, and this one is on cumulative impact recommendations for ORD research. Please go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Cullen. Um, I want to just um, reiterate other people's thanks to you, the members of the SAB for your time and your thoughtful consideration and advice on cumulative impacts issue and ORD's white I also want to recognize and thank my co-chairs and co-authors, who it has been a privilege uh, for me to work with on this paper, um, Sarah Major, Nicole Tolvey, and Sean Paul, among, among others. So thank you, all of you. Next slide. Um, I think that Bray gave a, a really good intro to why we even approach doing a white paper on the cumulative impacts topic. It's rooted in the pre President Biden's um, uh, emphasis on um, on environmental justice and climate, the climate crisis, with his two executive orders that he put out there, um, and it's also um, responsive to the EPA administrator Regan's um, agency wide directive that he gave um, to take steps to better serve historically marginalized communities using cumulative impact assessment. So the Office of Research and Development in EPA is is working to ensure that our research portfolio aligns with these priorities. Next slide. Um, so ORD is undergoing research planning for FY23 to 26 right now as we speak. And we recognize and affirm cumulative impacts as an area of research that cuts across all of our national research programs. And it really needs to be coordinated across our national research programs. We have a core set of models already, methods and tools that we have right now that we can use. Um, and we also know that they can be further developed to um, improve to be applied to a broader array of issues. So the goal in this next research plan is to provide the best available science um, to support decisions to protect and promote individual and community environmental health. Next slide. Um, to, to this end of the executive orders and EPA Regan's um, statements as well, already formed a work group that is, was comprised of experts from across our national research programs and centers, as well as from our Office of Environmental Justice and our regional office representatives for environmental justice and research. We developed a charter as a first step that is in that top box on the slide there stating our workshop goals, which were to promote research in ORD to improve our understanding of cumulative impacts, develop and apply the necessary models, methods, et cetera, to conduct real world assessments of cumulative impacts that could result in adverse and beneficial health and environmental effects so that internal and external partners can be informed and make scientifically credible decisions to protect and promote individual community uh, and environmental health. The specific elements um, of our charge are listed there on the slide and they align closely with the sections of the white paper that you have received. Um, but it really, the paper really culminates in the recommendations to ORD on broad areas of research to address parity gaps. Next slide. To 
um, to meet the charge that we established for ourselves. We started with holding listening sessions in 2021 on cumulative impacts. We reached out through the Environmental Council of States and the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. And we also reached out to tribes, Alaska Native Villages and tribal consortiums. So that resulted in a broad audience um, that participated in our listening sessions that you can see there with tribes, state agencies, local agencies, and even national associations. We asked the tribes, um, states, and local agencies, and communities about their experiences, their most pressing technical challenges, and the science needs that they had with respect to cumulative impacts so that that could inform our research planning for the 23 to 26 timeframe. There were a lot of concerns that were expressed. They were expressed about extreme events. Um, the scale of information, that finer scale information is needed that's applicable to neighborhoods, neighborhood scales. There were tribal uh, con specific concerns that were brought up around equity and traditional knowledge, such as food deserts and community health, safe levels of consumption of fish, um, and integration of traditional tribal life ways and practices into risk assessments. States expressed a lot of needs around exposure and health from chemical and non-chemical stressors and the need for tools and resources to prioritize those stressors that uh, may have a greater effect on cumulative impacts than others um, and to identify uh, mitigation strategies that would be applicable for permitting and enforcement. They also were hoping for um, a lot more training to be offered on these tools. One of the common things we heard across the listening sessions was a desire for a consistent definition and approach to cumulative impacts and cumulative impact assessments because uh, what they were starting to see was each individual state agency or community or something like that come up with some interpretation um, and it could be different across agencies. Next slide. So once the listening sessions were complete, we held a, a, a workshop that was in two parts um, in the early and late fall um, to learn about cumulative impact assessment needs inside the agency and outside both. So we had two panels that we, we held. The first was um, with our program office and regional office um, comrades sort of in to high, higher in the agency to get their perspective on their needs across their program offices and regions. Um, we also held a panel with uh, community members um, and to get their perspectives and needs that were grounded in their experiences. We had several speakers address us on cumulative impacts, both at the state and community levels. They're listed here, Dr. Nikki Sheets, Dr. Anna Baptista and Dr. Nataki osborne Jelks all spoke um, and provided really valuable information. Um, then we um, ended the workshop with, um, with an internal EPA discussion that was for researchers to work together to identify priorities and then use real world, world scenarios to develop research that incorporates cumulative impacts. Next slide. Some of the things we learned from all of these panels and workshops um, are, are listed here uh, for communities. Um, as has been mentioned already, cumulative impacts really is sort of the holy grail for, um, of environmental justice. They see this as a path to being heard and understood in terms of what they face. Um, within and outside of EPA, um, we heard that they want us to have a bias toward action rather than inaction and to develop and provide interventions now through working with our partners to understand their needs, while at the same time we continue to do research to support cumulative impact assessments. So have a parallel track um, acting now using best available science and then enhancing our ability to do cumulative impact assessments in the future. We were also encouraged by our program and regional offices to consider cross-program, cross-agency approaches to address community needs and capacity, capacity and to consider communities' total environment, as well as to translate research for community application, to provide solutions um, and take a whole of government approach where needed. We were also encouraged to work in true partnership with communities to prove ourselves 
trustworthy um, because they pointed out that there are barriers to trust of the government that exist at all levels. One of the community members encouraged us to map solutions, not problems, and that was affirmed by many others. Um, they said they know what the problems are that they face. Their people are experiencing repetitive loss and have no capacity to plan and recover. Um, we were encouraged by internally and externally to embrace social science and social science research um, and to provide access to data to make it transparent so that communities could understand um, the data and how it supports changes in regulations and policies. And finally, they encouraged us to operate to do no harm. We heard this from one of the speakers, that if the effects are, are certain, take care about how the results are communicated. And if we cannot prove that there is no harm, we should assume that there is. So that's a summary of what we heard. Um, we then, as a work group, um, developed uh, operational definitions of cumulative impacts and cumulative impact assessments that um, would allow us to move forward in developing rec recommendations for our researchers. So uh, one of the key um, emphases in the definition is that we're looking at total burden and that the total burden encompasses direct health effects and indirect effects to people through impacts on resources and the environment that affect human health and well-being. We also uh, included chemical and non-chemical stressors, as well as their, and importantly, their interaction. It also, the definition also includes contemporary exposures um, in various environments where individuals spend their time, as well as past exposures that could have lingering effects. Cumulative impacts then provides the context for conducting cumulative impact assessments. And these assessments require characterizing the potential state of vulnerability or resilience of the community. Um, for example, their ability to withstand or recover from additional exposures under consideration. Um, cumulative impact assessments explore how stressors from the built natural and social environment affect people, potentially causing or exacerbating adverse outcomes. And Assessments also account for health mitigating factors or solutions aimed at improving health and well being. Next slide. So, one of the questions that has come up and that we have asked you to provide advice on is how cumulative risk assessment and cumulative impact assessment are different. In EPA's 2003 document, the framework for cumulative, cumulative risk assessment. EPA defines it as an analysis, characterization, and possible quantification of the combined risks to human health or the environment from multiple agents or stressors. There, um, our work group could not find articles in the peer reviewed literature that delineated the difference between cumulative risk assessment and cumulative impact assessment. Um, there is a lot of literature that addresses cumulative risk assessment and broadly describes it as a methodology used to answer a specific question, whereas cumulative impact assessment is used to describe all the factors that affect individuals, families, groups, and communities. So the, the concept of cumulative impacts came from the EJ movement in response to the limitations of risk assessment. Um, the, the NRC um, produced a, a not a few publications that address risk assessment and describe it as seeking to simplify the multi-dimensionality multi of the risk or make sense of the uncertainty. They also describe it as requiring a volume of information and analysis that far outstrip the resources available to provide them. In contrast, um, cumulative impacts is a, is a term that communities understand Charles Lee um, from EPA um, uh, wrote, noted in a journal article from 2021 that there is widespread understanding among communities with EJ concerns of cumulative impacts because they have often suffered from a concentration of multiple environmental, public health, and social stressors. 
So EPA's preliminary thinking is that quantitative um, cumulative risk analysis is a long-term goal, but while that is, we have to address cumulative impacts now for the pressing issues that communities are facing. Unfortunately, we don't have that much quantitative data to address those issues. So cumulative impact assessment can be a very practical and immediate way um, to address them. It's, it's a near-term alternative. It can account for multiple stressors. It can allow for qualitative as well as quantitative approaches and provide a multi-attribute um, information approach that's useful for decisions, even if there isn't a single aggregated risk number for each possible adverse outcome pathway. We look forward to your feedback um, to better help us delineate these two approaches and their application. Next slide. This uh, is a, a figure that also depicts cumulative impact assessments for another way to express it. It's adapted from Tulvi et al. 2016 and re represents the complex interrelationship among components describing cumulative impacts. In adapting the figure, we used a radial cycle diagram because it shows the relationship of components to a central idea. And that central idea um, in the radial diagram is that health, well-being, quality of life in the center of the circle is influenced by chemical stressors, non-chemical stressors, activities, behaviors, lifestyles, and systems, systems biological factors. By using this design approach, we can show that all four areas have an equal likelihood of affecting health and well, well-being and quality of life. With the next concentric, concentric ring, we show that there are factors, <coughs> history, or, or something else that influenced the stressors, activities, and system biology to affect health and well being and quality of life. For example, there may be a local decision about where to put a school or a grocery store that affects quality of life. The outermost circle shows that the total environment is comprised of the built, natural, and social environments, and the total environment influences everything found in it. And then to the left of the radial diagram is a bar showing that the diagram is applicable at multiple scales from the individual to family to groups, communities and up. Next slide. So um, following the definition and figure development, we identified uh, gaps and barriers that we needed to address with our recommendations. And these arose um, from the listening session the panels, the workshops that we held um, and, um, and so the primary concerns in terms of gaps came down to understanding what the priority chemical and non-chemical stressors are and how we characterize them. Um, the appropriate and available methods to use for any given decision um, and da the data availability to address cumulative impacts, especially at high resolution temporally and spatially. These were the, the, the primary gaps that we felt were most important. And then the, the, the really important barriers included how we tackle cumulative impacts when we don't have the right skill set and expertise within EPA, who to work with, um, and what the mechanisms are that are there that we can use to build partnerships with communities and tribes, because that can be a very hard thing to do in a federal government. And then how we guarantee that we can maintain relationships and deliver on results despite having fluctuating resources. Um, next slide. I'm gonna just go over uh, a, a brief summary of the recommendations that are in the white paper that you have, um, just by category, not uh, go into details around them. There are five general categories of recommendations. Um, the first is establishing a decision context and stakeholder engagement. This includes all aspects of a decision context including identifying and engaging partners, making sure to understand the policies and decisions that are being considered and available and appropriate tools, establishing trust and two part, true partnership yeah. with communities and translating the research into action with them. It also includes providing te technical support for implementing cumulative impact analysis and recommendations that specifically, we also have recommendations in there that specifically link our research to the cross-agency efforts that are spearheaded by the agency equity team. In the second 
um, area of recommendations address scientific considerations for meeting partner needs. We have in there recommendations around developing fit for purpose approaches to quantify assets and vulnerabilities, to characterize exposure to stressors from built natural and social environments, to evaluate prevalent health disparities and well being impacts, to identify intervention points and evaluate impacts of policies and interventions that address cumulative impacts. Um, we also um, look, we also know that in these recommendations, there is a path forward that we have, um, are in the beginning stages of developing um, over the last decade or so, connecting multiple stressors to cumulative impacts. Um, we've, used, um, we've used our research to do that and touch on them in the recommendations. For example, we have done epidemiological studies that use electronic health records where we do connect chemical um, and non-chemical stressors and look at the potential effect. Final category is, um, I mean, I'm sorry, the third category, because we've got two more, um, is empowering local decisions and actions. Um, and the recommendations in there are around supporting fit for purpose use of community generated data and information um, in cumulative impact assessments and assisting communities by providing them access to transparent data and resources, providing training and technical support and infrastructure around our methods and guidance and tools. Next slide. Uh, the fourth area of recommendations is around supporting science translation and delivery. And this focuses on cumulative impacts assessments that deliver solutions to improve community health and well-being, and translating our community-based research approaches and results across geographic and other contexts so that they're not just one-off studies, and then increasing the usability and user-focused design of our scientific tools, products, and communication methods. And then the fifth and final area is, is providing research management support for cumulative impact assessments. What can we do at an ORD structural level to help researchers do cumulative impact assessments. And those recommendations include integrating cumulative impact research into our portfolio, addressing technological workforce and cultural issues around doing cumulative impact assessments and helping to build the partnerships to advance cumulative impact research and policy. Next slide. Thank you very much for your time. That's uh, the conclusion of my remarks. Thank you so much. And thank you to all the EPA speakers. Um, really appreciate these presentations. I am thinking that we need to take a break. We are slightly behind where I thought we would be in our uh, agenda, but not too far off. Um, but let me just review what we're going to do when we come back and then we can get ready for that. Um, this is a consultation for EPA. So we have um, charge questions that our members have been responding to in written comments. And those preliminary written comments are on the um, SAB website. And at the conclusion of this meeting, members of the chartered SAB will write final comments and those will all be submitted to EPA. This is a compilation of, of comments that we'll be providing, uh, reflecting on this work, reflecting on these charge questions. So that is our, our goal for the remainder of today and possibly into next time, depending on how, how we do. Um, I will say that uh, I was going to review all the charge questions, but I think since we're going to go through them anyway and talk about each one, in lieu of just reading off each one and, and asking if there are questions on it uh, before we dig in, I think maybe we'll just do that as part of our um, as part of our covering the charge questions when we come back from the break and hearing members' comments. Uh, and we can also field questions for EPA at that time, unless someone from the SAB staff office tells me that that's not a, a great idea. But other, otherwise, I think we should take a break. Tom, are you, and, and will we have the charge questions on the screen while we're, when we come back, when we're going through this? Uh, yes, we, uh, we can put them up. And yeah, I think I that will be. Helpful. I think it'd be a much better idea to get right into the discussion rather than having a separate review discussion of reviewing the questions. So. Yeah, I think we can do both at the same time. Uh, we will be going through them one by one, so do not worry. We will get them all. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a break. Um, let's reconvene 
here it's 1224, for others it's 324. How about if we reconvene at uh, 332 on the East Coast and 1232 on the West Coast? I think we need that break. Thanks all. Is that 332? Yes, please. Am I correct? Yes, okay. please. Should have about six minutes. All right.
All right. I realized that was a short break, but uh, really appreciate everyone hanging in there. So let's reconvene. As I said before the break, uh, we are going to walk through the charge questions one at a time and take both clarifying questions for EPA and also responses and comments. Recalling though that all of our individual and detailed comments will be compiled and will be distributed to EPA. So it is not necessary that we all get into every detail of every one of our comments in this session, but it's a chance to hear from EPA where we need clarifications and for them to hear from us about sort of high level and important points that we want to make in this time. And it looks like there is in the chat, let's see. Okay. Uh, all right, so Tom Armitage, I believe you said you could put the charge questions on the screen for us. I think that would help. Thank you. All right, anything else before we start on this? I think I'm ready to go ahead and go through these one by one. All right. Uh, so in terms of the first question, we, we have four altogether. There are four questions. The first question has three subparts. We have a question two that has two subparts um, and so on. Each question has its own parts. The first one is about near-term application of cumulative impact assessment and decision-making. Uh, there's a brief statement about the motivation behind this question and, and what they're asking for here. EPA recognizing that cumulative impact assessment presents opportunities to incorporate both quantitative and qualitative data for combinations of chemicals and non-chemical stressors to inform decisions, depending on the state of knowledge, including availability of data, availability of methods. And furthermore, EPA recognizes the need to apply available methods and data to existing problems. And in this context, as I said, there are uh, three subparts. So for the first subpart, what applications of cumulative impact assessment are supported by currently available data and methods for example, based on decision context, data availability, or other factors. Clarifications from our SAB members, first of all, about that. All right, I will move to the second one and then we'll have the comments all as a group across the three subparts. Uh, part B, what recommendations do SAB members have for incorporating particular stressors that are frequently present in communities? For example, poverty, food deserts, lack of green space, legacy contaminated soils, and this in conjunction with additional stressors, chemical and non-chemical, that may be unique to particular communities. Clarifying question about this one, Dr. Borsak. Yeah, hi. I wasn't quite sure if I understood this question to mean um, are they looking for recommendations on the particular stressor, like suggestions for what stressors or methods for incorporating stressors? Thank you. I would welcome EPA to answer. Is there a response from? I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll answer that. I'll, okay, I'll, thank I'll you. I'm Paul, I'm with ORD. Um, and it's the latter. We are looking for methods for incorporating uh, particular stressors. Thank you. And then the part C for near-term applications, how do SAB members suggest that EPA scientifically address multiple uncertainties? This would include compounded uncertainties when multiple data and stressors and indicators are used in a single cumulative impact assessment. And please provide recommendations for combining data of different quality, rigor, and uncertainty in a single cumulative impact assessment. Dr. Wilson has raised a hand. That might be for a clarifying question, and we'll see if there are others. Go ahead, Dr. Yeah, I was gonna make a couple of quick comments. Uh, sure. On B, I mean, I think there's some progress been made in uh, geovisualization tools and looking at stressors. And I would say, you know, look to those tools for, for more, um, you know, uh, opportunity. We are in the process of building out our Maryland EJ screen tool to capture some of these issues, both on the pathogenic side and salinogenic side, and bringing in additional stressors at both the block group level, the track level, and also other units of analysis. So I think that's progress there. And then uh, I'll just want to piggyback on Dr. Barsic's comment about HIAs as a as a as adaptable framework, um, and looking at the 
the work on the public health exposed zone. Uh, that's a paper that wasn't mentioned. I'm not sure y'all mentioned that before, but the public health exposed zone as a fra framework that could be helpful for some, not necessarily on C, but more on B. Um, and then, and then I just want to say that I'll stop there. Thank you. That's all right. You could, you, if you have one more thing to say, go ahead, please. Oh yeah. I just want, I just, just want to say that, you know, with Dr. Barker's comment, he, he mentioned HIAs. I think there's some opportunity, there's an advantage because it's a flexible framework. Um, and then there's a whole, there's a whole emerging HIA sub, of uh, sub of space or subgroup on health equity impact assessments, which I think would bring in some of these other, uh, uh, non-chemical stresses of concern too. So I just wanted to, to state that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Bruder, you've got your hand up. Yeah, thanks. Um, I find the, in, in C, I find it really difficult to uh, know how to respond to recommendations for combining data of different quality rigor and uncertainty in a single cumulative impact assessment. I, to me, that's a, obviously you're going to have to assess the quality of data to decide whether or not it is suitable for inclusion or exclusion. And that must entail some clear documentation of inclusion exclusion criteria uh, to justify what, you're, what you do or don't do. But was there something more specific that EPA was looking for? Yes, EPA, would you like to respond? Hi, this is Maureen Gwynn. I'm with the US EPA. It's, it, it is a very fairly broad question in that way. It's not something necessarily overly specific that we're looking for, but I think I think part of how you started the question is sort of where we are coming from as well in terms of how best to address it when we're looking at data quality. If you have different stressors that you're bringing in and different data sources with different levels of uncertainty, how would this panel recommend that we address that? Um, so nothing, nothing very specific there, but any recommendations would be welcome for how best to combine that data. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Guckenheimer. I'm very uh, confused about the differences in the way in which you look at the traditional kinds of things that the AP EPA has involved itself in evaluating toxicity and carcinogenicity of um, different substances and uh, stressors like food deserts or poverty, which are things that are uh, aspects that, that the EPA has, has not uh, had a hand in and involve um, entities that really aren't governmental entities at all. They really require investing resources in places rather than deleterious effects of things that have been done. Thanks, I don't know if EPA would like to clarify on that. And, and Dr. Guckenheimer, I noticed that you also in your written comments had um, suggested that there's a need for metrics for these various things. And I think that goes directly to the question you just asked as well, right? I mean, if you're right. trying to put uh, metrics on these different things, that's quite a yeah. challenge, yes. Uh, absolutely, um, and in, in my written comments on one of the, the, the lighter items I said, <clears throat> Uh, that I don't really know uh, what it what environment what it would look like to assess whether um, environmental justice has been done. Mm -hmm. What are the metrics that we use in order to evaluate uh, that um, particular communities have been disadvantaged? Uh, in many cases, it's clear that that's the case. Uh, but we have to express, given past history, that there are going to be parties that are going to challenge any action that the EPA takes. Thank you. EPA, would you like to respond? This is, this is Tim Barzik. I can uh, take a crack at this. These are Thank excellent you. questions, of course. Um, for the first one, in terms of accounting for food deserts and some of these other stressors that we typically have not in the past. <clears throat> Recently, I've been thinking about it from the, from the standpoint of the cumulative impacts of the environmental burdens themselves. Many of the things that one would generally think might fall into someone like the EPA's purview, these facilities, these parcels of land, these, these different things are producing pollutants and 
chemicals, but they're also producing many other impacts. Um, if, if one of them is contributing to food deserts, then we, we should be accounting for that. We should be understanding that. If food deserts are present in the surrounding community, that could be influencing their baseline health. We should also be considering that. But in a way, there's, there is a way to differentiate between many of the cumulative impacts within these sort of environmental contexts that we may be able to, to focus more upon. However, we need to acknowledge the, the existing conditions within the community. And in, in the past, something that fell outside of one's purview was generally ignored. And I think that's one of the hurdles we need to get over right now. We need to acknowledge the state of lived experience that these communities are facing. And if food deserts are one of those stressors within a given community, and that may not be in all communities, but in a given community, then those environmental burdens are going to have a certain impact because of that. And if we continue to ignore that, that's where we become disenfranchised from the decision-making process with the community as a partner, because they need us to know that that's important to them. So that would be the way I would, might look at it. Thank you, Dr. Barzik. I would call on Dr. Wilson and then uh, Dr. Anarua. Yeah, thank and you, I'll be quick. Dr. Pullen Fudnick. Yeah, so uh, to, uh, to Tim's point, I think that's really, really important. Um, I was on the, uh, the Exposure Science and 21st Century Committee we had a charge to write, write that report. And as part of that charge, they didn't want us to talk about non-chemical stressors. And, and, and but we did talk about exposure inequities. So I would say that report has some utility to, to be exposure science in the 21st century. Uh, but then getting to see, we did, and this is getting back to my HIA uh, comment, we did look at the public health impacts of fracking, potential public health impacts of fracking in Maryland, and we used a hazard ranking approach. It's out there. We did look at data quality rigor in certainly a little bit in this hazard ranking approach as relates to how fracking could impact primary impacts and secondary effects. So that is one way to get at cumulative impacts. And that's why, and I'll keep leaning on that HIA framework because of this flexibility. And also the scoping part, which I know we'll talk about later. So I just want to, I'll say that real quickly. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Wilson. I would call on Dr. Anaru. Okay, so um, Dr. Wilson had actually talked touched on, on uh, some other things I wanted to say, but um, to, to really get a holistic um, uh, understanding and, and uh, analysis of the cumulative impact, I think it, it, there has to be a combination of different things. Um, uh, the health impact assessment or definitely should be one of it, um, but there's also the EJ uh, screening tool that is uh, being developed that should be also part of it because that incorporates some of the things that are being um, you know, mentioned where the gap exists and things that are not currently uh, incorporated or, or um, looked at when, when addressing um, health you know, cumulative impact on the community. And then also I think uh, the vulnerability assessment um, tool should be um, really important in looking at the uh, cumulative impact. Mm -hmm. And this vulnerability assessment tool um, is kind of similar to the, um, the hazard ranking approach that uh, Dr. Wilson um, mentioned. So uh, it, to, to summarize, I think we're going to have to look at all these different tools and come up with something that captures majority of the things that are being, uh, that have been left out in looking at the impact of environmental pollution and other things. And I think this will address both the chemical and the non-chemical um, aspects of that. Thank you. And I had a couple of uh, questions in the chat. Uh, folks are wondering if we've moved from clarifications into comments. I know some of these have been more of comments. If there still are clarifications, I'm happy to field those, but uh, it's fine if we're, if we're moving into comments. Uh, let's see, Dr. Poland-Fednick, then Olmsted, Arvai, and Beck. 
Yeah, perfect. I actually did have a clarifying question, especially on C, and maybe it also relates then to A, uh, you know, really trying to understand, you know, in terms of applications and the ways in which you would address uncertainty, uh, it, it seems as though it's really decision context specific, right? So if we're looking at this under NEPA, it's going to be very different than the Safe Drinking Water Act and very different than TSCA, for example. So, you know, could we utilize uncertainty factors to account for human, you know, uh, intra, intra species, you know, variability under TSCA um, that that, you know, brings into account the fact that there are going to be differences in exposure, dif differences in susceptibility, differences in vulnerability, um, you know, across populations under NEPA, you know, if we're incorporating this under, you know, the uh, environmental impact statements, you know, ensuring that, uh, that, that the factors that need to be taken into account are taken into account is a very different pathway. And so just understanding if, if the, the question is asking about, you know, across all of these different pathways. And then the, the uh, second kind of clarifying question then relates to kind of A and to C in a way um, is, you know, I find myself, uh, you know, when in thinking about these questions is that we're really focused uh, extremely heavily on the data, you know, what we need in order to absolutely make the most certain uh, uh, decisions. And so, you know, ultimately, you know, this is really about how do we get to the place in which we can make decisions with the information we have and not make this into an additional scientific exercise that's, that's just increasingly burdensome for communities to have to get over over in order to make, you know, decisions happen that are going to benefit them and the, the people that they live around. And so, you know, even though, again, a lot of the questions that we're talking about today are data centric, I really just want to make sure that we don't lose sight of the fact that we have information to act. And when we talk about, say, Bradford Hill criteria, you know, uh, you know, even within that paper, you know, and when he was, um, you know, developing his framework for, for understanding causality, that it wasn't about, you know, the absolute certainty, but really being able to act when we have information that suggests that there are problems that are occurring in the first place. Thanks. Thanks for that comment. And did you want clarification from EPA about that? It sounded like- Yeah, I think it would be great. Yeah, yes. just to get a sense yes. of you know, how they want us to approach these questions. Yes. Hi, yes, this is Maureen going again. I'll, I'll give this one another shot. I, I think actually, uh, thank you for that comment, particularly the last part, the second part of the comment. I think you, you pretty much hit the nail on the head with where this question was going in terms of um, you know, this, this consultation in part is split between you know, what can we do right now with what we have in hand and what can we do longer term in terms of research needs. And so um, for this particular question, it is more on that, that first part in terms of, we do have data, we do have information, there are methods out there, what can we do? How, how can we get some advice from, from all of you from, from this consultation on, on what to do with what we have in hand to move forward? Uh, and then the second, the latter part of this discussion will be more on some of that, um, the research and the sort of the science needs and how to expand on that. For, for C, I think um, part of this, you know, we, we talk about near-term applications, you're correct. It's, it really will be context specific. Um, so it, it will vary. Like you said, in, in some cases we use uncertainty factors. This would be a, a little bit different in terms of bringing in different data sources, um, you know, multiple, you know, sort of the traditional data, the, the non-chemical, chemical stressors, both, both of those. And how would we, Sort of incorporate that uncertainty issue moving forward, and and again, when you know thinking about this in terms of of doing either whether it's multiple multiple data streams, chemical non chemical indicators um, in a single cumulative impact assessment, or how would we look at things that were um, uncertainties across multiple assessments for sort of um, single traditional data that we would have done previously. Hopefully that didn't muddle it anymore, but um, I, I think for us, for this question in particular, it is what can we do with what we have in hand or with some limited adjustments with what's available to us now. Yeah, I think this is, that, that's really helpful because in some ways when we're thinking about cumulative impact or even if I jump into the cumulative risk a little bit, you know, there's uncertainty associated with multiple aspects of that risk equation. And so being able to, to, to bring into account, you know, the, the cumulative impacts issues across the board seems like a really critical one. So that's really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. I'm calling Olmsted, then Arvai, Beck, Samet, and Weintraub. Thanks so much. I think I have a better understanding of, of where um, y'all were coming from in, in writing this, just hearing the presentation. So that's very, very helpful. Um, I think my my brain is, is hurting trying to figure out the question of which processes at EPA, uh, you know, if you did have specific processes in mind, would some of these types of analyses that you're building toward be uh, useful for? So, you know, 
I think a lot of the discussion that we heard in the public comments and a lot of the examples that folks have given even in, within the SAB and the EPA staff um, have been about citing permitting kinds of decisions where, right, you're making a, a choice, you know, within the agency that that affects, you know, a local area, maybe with some, you know, kind of out of area effects as well, but primarily the effects would be kind of, you know, quite localized. And there I can see kind of building toward a systematic way of, you know, incorporating uncertainty and the richness of the local information about the local environment like that, you know, that the items that are listed, for example, in B, poverty, food, deserts, lack of green space, legacy contamination, and so on. Um, but but my one point of confusion is that I, maybe this is me as a newcomer to the SAB, but I think of some of those processes like NEPA as primarily driven by other agencies, not by the EPA. So it would help me to know, you know, kind of what EPA's role is in some of those, you know, highly localized decisions uh, to, you know, be able to give better advice about how to use this kind of rich data to, to inform that kind of a process. And then the second piece of it is that when I try to jump to, the kinds of major rules, right, that we see coming in, you know, EPA's regulatory agenda, things like a renewable fuel standard or, you know, reconsidering a national ambient air quality standard for one of the criteria pollutants or, you know, some of the, you know, what tend to be these kind of headliner rules. When I think about the types of, you know, the economic analysis and the EJ, you know, analysis that would be done at a national scale for rules like that, it's much, much harder for me to see how one would build up from this really rich local information right, in that kind of a national, you know, kind of rulemaking process. So I sort of feel like there's a, and, and I think the report acknowledges that there would be a range of ways to apply some of these principles, depending on the context, the decision-making context. And I appreciated that nuance, but it's still, as I kind of read through the, um, you know, the, the really interesting material in the report, I didn't quite have a sense for how EPA is envisioning that, you know, kind of staged or, you know, kind of different approach given different decision-making contexts. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Dr. Olmstead. Uh, EPA representatives, would you like to address that question? Yeah, this is Tom Paul again. I'm wondering if, uh, if Chris Dawkins is still on the line and could take it. Uh, if not, then, um, then we can give this one to Tim Barzik. I get this is Chris. I can um, speak a little bit to the, um, to that sort of rule, major rulemaking or national context. And when I say a little bit, it's hard for us to <laughs> envision it too, but, um, but to the extent that it can inform these analyses that are already part of that um, rulemaking, whether it's benefits analysis, the EJ analysis, um, then uh, whatever these tools or methods are, um, that are available to us fit naturally into our sort of existing rulemaking process. Um, as far as how to do that, it's hard to, to see building up you know, from rich local information you know, for me as well, but um, we'd welcome any, any thoughts you did have on that. Thank you. I Doc? could chime in as well. Yes, okay. go ahead, thank you. Thank you. Um, and I, I hope I understand the questions, but going back to the first one in, in terms of, for example, the permitting, which, which really is an ex excellent example of a lot of what we're talking about today. Um, they, are, they are very locational, absolutely. And, and um, we've been involved in, in, a, in a couple uh, consultations with regions in terms of uh, some specific permitting actions uh, and their potential impacts. And, and the idea here would be to not not have the EPA necessarily go into each decision on each renewal or on each uh, application uh, and, and do an HIA for that site, for example, but to really learn from, from those case studies, from those examples, to develop those best practices, because ultimately we'll need to work with our state and local partners on things like that. And that would require buy-in and collaboration and, and, and a sort of mutually you know, beneficial approach to how we're going to address cumulative impacts and permitting. And some locations and regions may be more amenable to that than others. And we have to acknowledge that. Uh, but if we can work with some of our state and local uh, decision makers who are involved in permitting, and this is actually happening, and, and really consult with them to develop a process whereby they can con 
consider cumulative impacts, even at this stage, it, at just in just some first order way. You know, this is going to be a, a growing process for all of us, and we're really figuring it out as well ourselves too. But if we can work with them and start to develop best practices so that they can implement it in a way that works for them, you know, in a way that works for that state, but still following, you know, this, this approach uh, that has been sort of vetted and, and you know, uh, evaluated and stuff so that they can adopt it for themselves uh, would be one of the goals of that, to be able to work locally, but apply nationally. Um, and I would say similarly for sort of the national scale implementations, let's look at how these national scale regulations are impacting individual communities. Um, they're going to be impacting them each differently. And if we can find, you know, these commonalities of, of how these things translate from one scale to another, we can start to address how to, how to tackle those issues. So there, there's definitely work to be done. Uh, and, I, and I think working in concert with state and local partners on these issues will help us identify sort of these specific case studies where we can then develop best practices that anyone uh, could hopefully follow. Thank you. Thank you. I'll call Dr. Arva and then Beck, Samet, Weintraub, Chu, and Bond. Thanks, Allison. And thanks to the EPA for putting this all together. I mean, it's a really ambitious and important initiative. I have a couple of, of questions. I'm not sure if they have answers right away, but I'll ask them anyway. The first one is that some of the attributes that are being considered uh, are both stressors and impacts. So poverty is the classic example here. Uh, on top of this, if you are gonna uh, engage with communities around data inputs and also consequences in terms of cumulative effects, I have a feeling a lot of these well-being based uh, impacts are gonna come up. So I think it would be worthwhile for EPA to spend some time trying to figure out if in fact they wanna use certain attributes as stressors or if they instead wanna put them in the impacts column. Uh, and that would apply to, I think, a wide range of uh, stressors slash impacts. I give poverty as one example. So in other words, poverty could exacerbate vulnerability at the same time, uh, stressors could enhance or exacerbate poverty as an impact. So that was my first question. Um, the second question I had um, is, is really a, a much bigger one, and it, and it I think, relates to what uh, Dr. Pullen uh, uh brought up, which is, I, I don't really see how this is going to work. Um, and I, you know, I read the, the white paper over and over again, trying to understand how this would work in practice. So much of what's in the white paper around uh, impacts assessment is focused on data collection and data inputs or data outputs. Um, yet so much of, uh, of the kind of subtext around the document and the process is around decision-making and action. And making that leap from data to decisions, um, even if you're talking about case studies, this is gonna be, um, well, it's gonna be really hard. Uh, you know, we've, we've done a little bit of research on this as a community and by, by, by a little bit, I mean an awful lot in terms of volume, but a drop in the bucket in terms of the amount of work that we would actually need to do to be able to come up with robust processes that could be applied through time and across contexts in a reliable way. Um, so I, I really love the ambition here. And again, I think this is really important stuff. I'm just struggling to see how this gets implemented in real life. So those are my two questions. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Arvai. And uh, if EPA would like to comment on that, I, I invite you now, although I will say that that second one in particular could be an extremely long answer and might not fit into the rest of the time that we have today. Well, this is, um, this is boring, Gwen. I, I would agree. Um, I, good comments, good questions. Uh, I appreciate the thoughtfulness for this and, and for the written comments we already received as well. Um, you know, starting with the second one, I, we, we acknowledge how ambitious this, this was in part. Um, you know, we, when we, we started working on the white paper and pulled this together, we knew that this was not going to be an easy lift. It was going to be something that would, would take time. Part of the the consultation when we talk about help, helping us prioritize sort of where to start and what directions um, is, is to help us with that sort of focus that we needed. Um, I think that also thinking about, um, thinking about it, it's not just an EPA. I, you know, there is, there is a world of research out there. There are the other federal agencies. Who would we best partner with, with at the state and, and um, community levels? 
So there's a lot of different pieces to this. And I think, you know, part of what we've been talking about with this consultation is this is the first step in a very long-term process that we'll be needing to do and, and build on. Um, as far as the first uh, question, I heard it more as a comment. So I, I think I would need a little bit more clarification as to what, what clarification you might need from EPA on that. So I'm sorry about that. And sh Dr. Arvai, should that stand as a comment for the moment? Yeah, I'll restate it. I think that something like poverty is both a stressor and an impact. And, you know, if you would need to decide how you want to use it in any formulation that would lead to some sort of okay. decision or, or action. Okay, no, I, I appreciate that comment. And it's something that we'll think about as we're, as we're going forward on this. Um, I, it, it is something that I don't think we clarified in that white paper. And again, part of the, the white paper is to inform our research going forward for the next four to 20 years. So I, it is something that we will take into consideration as we go forward on that. So thank you. Thank you. We'll call on Dr. Beck. Um, first, I really want to commend the agency for all the work they've done here. It's clearly a very difficult problem. Cumulative impact assessment is so broad and multifactorial. It's almost hard for me to think about all the multiple parts that one needs to consider. But I, as I thought about it more, I thought, well, it would be helpful for the agency to really consider a case study that you can work through and see what works and doesn't work. And I thought, well, there are a number of attributes one would want to consider with a case, such a case study. It's a situation where EPA, either in, tan in tandem with a sister agency or local agencies, has the ability to intervene because it has regulatory authority. And I think a such a case study should consider a health endpoint that's relatively well studied where there's existing information on the role of chemical and non-chemical stressors. And it occurred to me that looking at lead or mercury and neurodevelopmental endpoints might be a way to start because we have a health metric that is relatively commonly studied for both chemical and non-chemical stressors. Um, and this has even been considered in another publication that I mentioned in my uh, comments that came out a few years ago, looking at joint exposure to chemical and non-chemical neurodevelopmental stressors in women and, and of reproductive age and, and Haynes. So I think that rather than going from a very abstract concept, it might be useful to think of a particular case study that could be worked through where you know you have enough attributes that you may be able to get some type of answer in a reasonable period of time and see what you learn from that. Thank you, Dr. Beck. I think that's an excellent suggestion. I'll call on Dr. Samet. Okay, I haven't provided the written comments yet, but I think here's a preview of what they'll say. I understand we're talking about processes here, but the missing partner has really been the biological substrate for how all these Factors Act, uh, understanding of how multiple factors come together to affect human health and disease uh, states, and uh, how we think about how those factors act to, together. Uh, I think I've heard biology turned into a series of black boxes and uh, words like effect modification, for example, carry huge mechanistic um, implications. So it, it seems to me that the the discussion has to be broadened and far less siloed. And I think you've mentioned other partners, but just to name a, a few, there's a, an immense amount of work on life course and development of disease, the NIEHS ECHO program, and many rich uh, examples where some of the factors that um, have been mentioned have been uh, discussed. I mean, just take uh, childhood obesity, where there's a lot of interest in the impact of the environment ranging from prenatally uh, through early life and on where things, factors like food quality, uh, exposure to obesogens, however, taken in uh, by inhalation or ingestion are, uh, are looked at and where neighborhood characteristics uh, that determine exercise are important. So I think you need examples. Everybody has called for them, but I think you need uh, rich enough examples to try and turn processes into um, action. Because I, I, what I'm worried about is that uh, the, the, 
the process for pulling what we know about human biology into these uh, black boxes has not been laid out um, today, and it, nor in the document, and it certainly needs to be. So I'll stop there. Probably don't need to comment because uh, it might take forever. Appreciate your, your comments and uh, certainly the written comments we'll be looking forward to. And for everyone, um, yeah, re recalling that the details can go into the written comments as well. Dr. Weintraub. Thank you. Um, so first of all, thank you to EPA staff. This is quite an amazing bit of work. And I really appreciate the way that um, this topic is being raised um, and I'm glad that it is being approached. I also, in reading the um, recommendations, I, I think the recommendations are perfect. Um, it lays out, you know, step-by-step step and then broken down all of the areas that we as, you know, as a group need to approach this topic. And I think it's very tempting and I'm hearing it today um, to be kind of latching on to like a single uniform method. Like we need to define what is a cumulative impact assessment. What would that entail in the same way that we know what an environmental impact assessment is. We know what an health impact assessment is. We have all of these um, defined methods that, um, that everybody's agreed on, everybody. And then um, I think part of what has led us to this place is this um, problem that all of our accepted methods don't actually um, do exactly what we need them to do. And so um, I think what I'm trying to say is that just naming a new goal and a new um, method and defining its components is not necessarily going to get us where we wanna go, which is to make sure we're incorporating all of the many um, aspects of American life for individuals and the public that, um, that that can cause problems with their health. And then what is you know, EPA's role as, as a regulating and research agency to make sure that what comes forth to protect people or prevent problems is actually correct and based on you know, reasonable assumptions. So with that, I just wanna put in two plugs. One, um, I realized that Dr. Le Chevalier was not here today because um, I, otherwise would have counted on him to remind everyone that there are microbes um, that we care about. And um, I notice, and I know this is, this probably goes way back to, you know, EPA's regulatory roots. We really do sort of focus on this idea of chemical stressors and non-chemical stressors, which is like everything else. Um, and yet uh, I worry that we, are forgetting about the impact of, um, of you know, pathogens on human health and how that then interrelates with all of the other stressors that we're talking about. Um, I think they all, that's part of what we're trying to define with cumulative impact is how does everything interact together to create you know, a good environment versus a not good environment. Um, so I would like to suggest that even the definition of, of cumulative impact be, um, be revisited to make sure that it's fully um, inclusive of all of the various stressors um, when, and, and kind of maybe sees an opportunity to, to um, move past that delineation of chemical stressor versus not chemical stressor. Um, and then the other comment I had that I feel like is not um, well articulated yet and could be part of the recommendations is um, a development of not just not a method for assessing cumulative impact that everybody can agree is the right thing, but rather development of of um, of a rubric 
that we can agree could be used to help us identify whether a cumulative impact assessment is sufficient or not. And that way leaves the door open for these um, various um, settings in which we want to assess the cumulative impact of, of something, um, of the many things, um, to, to look at, to use whatever methods seem appropriate. And then we, as the scientific community and um, research community and policy community, have a way of looking at um, at what is done and saying, yes, that looks correct. You've done all the, you know, incorporated all of the various aspects that, that we think should be, or no, let's, you know, add in these things. You forgot to add this stress or you forgot to include, you know, this particular external factor um, or your, you know, quantitative methods that you were using were, you know, inappropriate or they were appropriate. So I, I kind of want us to, um, I think that that's probably enough. Um, thank you. I think I've gotten my point across. No, thank you, Dr. Weintraub. I probably should start doing a bit of timing. Uh, I really appreciate these comments. They're, they're excellent. They are definitely bleeding over into other parts of the charge about definitions, about gaps and barriers and research recommendations and other things. So I'm hoping that we've saved some time out of our later part of the charge questions because we've already heard some comments on a few of those. Uh, I'm going to call uh, Dr. Chu, Bond, and Shindell, and then I had a couple people who I think were wanted to make a second round of comments, and I would just ask each person to uh, please be brief, and if you have a second round of comments, that they really must be uh, directed at this particular charge question. Thank you. Dr. Chu. Hi there. Um, I'll be very uh, you know, succinct, hopefully. Um, I think, really, in terms of this near-term application, I really believe that the most Im impact would occur by um, really developing data tools and approaches to empower community action, right? So I don't think, you know, it's, this is gonna go into like a rulemaking tomorrow, um, but there, as the examples at the local level, not just what the ones that you've, the, the EPA has provided, but, you know, through, uh, throughout, the, you know, all the different community engaged work that's been done, you know, across the country, really empowering that local action uh, and develop, and but many communities don't have the resources or the expertise to either uh, gather the data, um, integrate the data to help support particular actions, uh, or you know, or to oppose particular actions uh, and obtain those resources. So, really, providing the tools, I think, the data, tools, and approaches, um, and is is really the, where in the near term, I, I think this could could make an impact. Um, and, you know, the second thing is that um, just conceptually, I think there's two ways in which those data and tools can, can make an impact. One is really that baseline information, because that really gets at, you know, what is the baseline burden in these communities uh, from not just, you know, chemical stressors, but all the other um, types of stressors. And, you know, is it really, you know, fair essentially to uh, have additional burdens or, uh, and also to point to, well, Identifying those burdens can also help to identify into, uh, potential interventions to, to uh, alleviate those, whether they're related to EPA or not. Um, you know, th this is all related to EPA kind of uh, regulatory, um, you know, re uh, they're, they're regular, they're sort of um, legal regulatory uh, um, purview or not. It can still be, be helpful to communities. And then the final thing I want, the third thing I just wanted to say is that I think, and it relates to, to C, but also more broadly, is that we really need to avoid the paralysis by analysis, which you know has has bogged down a lot of chemical risk assessment. And you know maybe this is an opportunity to develop tools and approaches that don't get stuck in that paralysis by analysis loop. Thank you, Dr. Shu. I will call on Dr. Bond. Thanks very much. Thank you. Oh, you're on. I'm on. Good. Thanks. Uh, so I wanted to make two comments. I will try to keep them brief. Um, and so the, the first one relates to what people have brought up. I hope this still qualifies as clarification, um, but people have brought up, how are we going to use this? And I feel like the near-term applications 
um, where it could be used, such as for decision making, um, could usefully be outlined in the document. I think that some of the questions that have been raised here suggest to us that we don't have the tools yet to address these complex problems and maybe not even the, the decision structures because some of them are multi-agency. And so we should keep that in mind and as well identify what can be done soon. So there's kind of a, at least a two-pronged approach, probably more. The other thing I wanna raise, it hasn't really been brought up and, and I'm not really sure how to frame this, but I can see a near-term application um, in which this understanding of impacts at a national scale and the populations upon which they fall actually shifts in our minds. And so what we're talking about in terms of decision is identifying what's really most important. We've gotten a sense of what's most important because of the magnitude of impacts, of, uh, of health impacts of, of air pollution, for example. Um, and when we start bringing in these, uh, these multi-stressor frameworks, it could be that we begin thinking differently about what's important and addressable. And I believe that some of what we heard from our public comment today. And so I just wanted to, to raise that as a potential application of, of needing to scale the sort of very rich, data rich, uh, experience rich community experiences to broader scales that what we're really talking about is the fact that we may not have our fingers on what is most important and what should be addressed for protection. And that is potentially a near-term application that this board should be thinking about. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Bond. Appreciate that very much. Uh, Dr. Schindel. Yes, thank you. I really wanted to raise uh, an issue. It's more of a comment, I suppose, that it relates a little bit to some of what a couple other uh, SAB members have, have brought up. And it's really thinking about, well, I guess I should say first that I, I really like this approach. And I think that it's extremely valuable to do these cumulative impact assessments. And so I'm, I'm thinking more about how to make them uh, robust to challenges that could arise in the future. And one of the things that I would see when this kind of thing is used for decision-making is that a challenge could arise on saying, okay, well, you, you don't wanna cite this facility in this particular location because their cumulative impact burden is much higher, but maybe the thing that should be considered is that this new facility will actually create a lot of jobs and raise people out of poverty. And so that will actually, you know, even though it's more polluting, it's changing these other factors. And so the cumulative assessment could lead to challenges based on things that are not within EPA's traditional analysis or EPA's purview. And the same kind of thing with the national level things, for, for example, uh, air quality standards, right? If you find that a particular level of, of risk reduction is achieved by lowering the standards, then you could face challenges on, well, maybe you could achieve the same thing by you know, funding supermarkets in places that have food deserts. And I don't know how EPA would necessarily respond to things like that, that are both outside its regulatory, but also its research expertise. So I guess it's, it's mostly a comment, but also a question a little bit to think about, which doesn't have to be answered right now during the Zoom. But if, if there's value in separately looking at stressors that are under EPA's purview for regulations versus stressors that are outside EPA's ability to control, like poverty. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Uh, so that was the list of folks that I had said I would call for this question. We are at the 50 minute point, just about. Um, I'm happy to take, it looks like Dr. Irwin, you have not had a chance to respond to this one yet. And if it's specifically on this, and then Dr. Pullen Fednick, if you have something pressing on this question, but honestly, if we spend an hour on each one, there's no way we're going to get through this. So I'm going to have to start timing these. All right, Dr. Had, Irwin. Sorry, I had my hand up. Just It was just, just a quick thing. If you give me a 30 seconds I'll, at the end, when everyone else has spoken. Uh, yeah, you had also spoken earlier, so I was trying to get it on okay, people with their first, their first chance. Thank you, Dr. Irwin. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Thank you, Dr. Pellin. I apologize. I had to step away for a few minutes, so this may have been addressed, but I do have a clarifying question, which is, 
in pretty much all the wonderful presentations, I'm really grateful for the presentations we saw. The focus was really on health outcomes and impacts. Um, so my question is, uh, to what extent uh, in the near term particularly, is EPA interested in other kinds of um, impacts? Um, so for example, ecological impacts that go, that aren't necessarily directly related to health impacts, as well as economic impacts. Uh, so that's my question. Thank you. Does EPA want to respond to that now, or is that something to take under advisement? Hi, this is Maureen Gwen. I would just add, uh, part of the focus was here on the sort of the health impacts, but taking into account the eco and the economic and other impacts um, is also part of what we want to do. I think the focus today might have sort of sounded a little bit more health focused, but we are looking at it um, sort of more holistically. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Pullen Fednick, second second round, a very brief comment or question. Yep, I can do it in 30 seconds. I just wanted to make sure I was clear in the initial comments that I made. So I, I wasn't making the point that this is a fruitless exercise. I actually think it's something that's really critical for the agency to do. And just to you know make sure that we're not uh, losing sight of the problem that we're trying to solve for, that we have, that there are communities right now, that we have the, dual, the tools to identify that are harmed by actions or the lack thereof in communities. And so, you know, really just, you know, uh, stressing that the agency should go into the docket to to look at, you know, what are the, the uh, things that communities are commenting on that are important to them, like RMP facilities, for example. And there's a wide body of evidence that suggests the relationships or even shows the relationships between chemical and non-chemical stressors. And so that's not something that we need to rediscover. It already exists. And so just assuming that there is that burden and then going in, especially for that, that section A, again, that question uh, A, for us to be able to think about the ways in which these tools can be applied now rather than reinventing the wheel. Thank you. You pack a lot into 30 seconds. <laughs> Dr. Wilson, a, a quick comment on this one before we move on. Yeah, we really will have to. I apologize. Yeah, I know we I know we need to move on, but I, I think the last two commenters capture my comments. I do a lot of EJ work. I, I do not want us to get into this bucket of talking about biology and diseases only. I think the previous comment for, for Dr. Uh, for Christie talked about this issue. Gentrification. You build a factory, the economic impacts, property values. There's so many other impacts that this discussion to this point has not even captured those things. I wanna make sure we, I wanna push back on that because that gets to spaces that communities like, that. that's like, we're not gonna work, we're not gonna do anything. We need to talk, this conversation as Chris just said is about getting to action. We have enough tools, we have some data, some of the data is not the best data, we can get more data. But to me, it's really about getting to action and using some of the tools frameworks we already have. Thank I, you. I, I, yeah, I, we really need to push on that. So I just wanted to, just to clarify, because I was a little concerned about some of the things that I heard, like, that's not what folks are saying. That's not what people on the ground are saying. And we this is this will be another 20 years of conversations based on some of the stuff I heard today, just, just in the last hour or so. I really appreciate that comment um, from everyone. Let's move to the second question. I, there will be more chances to reflect on all of this. And some of it is getting into frameworks and definitions. So the second question, uh, the white paper presents operational definitions of cumulative impacts and cumulative impact assessment and a modified total environment framework to visualize the complex interrelationship among built, natural, and social environments. And you saw that in the document. So the two charge questions we have here, please comment on the operational definitions. This would be cumulative impacts and cumulative impact assessment, as well as the application of modified total environmental framework. And then part B, although there are distinctions between cumulative impact assessment and cumulative risk assessment, the differences between these two would benefit from clear articulation. EPA is asking um, for comment on similarities and differences. They reflect that they've had stakeholder input um, that favors current and near-term focus on the application of cumulative impact assessment with available data and methods. We've actually heard some comments already related to some of this. Um, so looking for comments on similarities and differences uh, similarities or distinctions between decision contexts uh, as these are applied and how they are similarly or differently used. So I would um, start with clarification questions, but again, I know that there's a fine line and that we quickly move into comments. And I'm, yeah, I am going to time people and I think two minutes is, is fair. So go ahead, Dr. Borsak. Oh, well, mine was less of a clarification question, but and, um, I just thought the total environment framework when we're looking at the total environment should also include um, access to healthcare and other social services, as well as informal social support systems like community organizations, churches, et cetera. I think that infrastructure has been shown to have an important aspect in of mental and physical health and was missing from that um, from the framework in the document. Thanks, Dr. Borsak. 
other either clarifications of what this is asking? Dr. Wilson. Yeah, thank you. Just to restate my one of my earlier comments about the public health exposed zone framework, that would be really useful for, for A, uh, co-sign what Dr. Borza just said about these other infrastructures. I think that gets to the, um, from a systems approach, a system science approach, and you know, think about communities as ecosystems, that infrastructure, the, the, the health promoting, or what I like to say, the salutogenic infrastructure, that also speaks more to the cumulative impacts. And, and, I, and, and I wanna separate, get it to be from the cumulative risk. Risk is getting to causality, biology, mechanisms, that's, that's important. But cumulative impacts is at a different level, going back to the previous comment about social ecological model and looking at meso level factors and looking at systems. It's what systems, 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 infrastructure and systems. So thank you. Thank you. Well said. Others with either clarifications or comments. And I do know that we did some of the work on this earlier with some of the earlier comments. Go ahead, Dr. Guckenheimer, and then, uh, and then Dr. Morris. Just real briefly, one of the things that I said in my written comments is that I see the difference between cumulative impact assessment and cumulative risk assessment differently than I think has typically been done. And that uh, impact assessment, I think, is an assessment of what has happened. And risk assessment often is a judgment about what may happen. And as an example, consider the cost of flood insurance, or homeowner's insurance with regard to, to flood flooding. Uh, the rates get set very high for people who live in places that have not been flooded, but are judged to be at risk of flooding. Thank you. Excellent point. Let's see, Dr. Morris and then Dr. Beck. I, I, I have three points that I'll try to make in less than a minute. So one of the concerns I had is in defining <clears throat> cumulative impacts, they use terms that weren't defined. So specifically, there was no explicit definition of well-being or quality of life. So if there is an EPA official regulatory definition of those terms, it should be cited or provided. If, it's, if there isn't an official regulatory definition, I think they need to come up with one. Um, another term I had problems with, I thought it was confusing, is it referred to assessing problems at an individual level. And I don't exactly know what that meant. If that meant trying to do the impact assessment to protect the most vulnerable individual, I'm not sure that's at all possible. And if there's any confusion on what it is they're trying to protect or who, some subpopulation or individual, that needs to be really clear. Otherwise, when you get working with the community, it's, it's going to dis destroy trust. And my, my third comment is you ask whether the distinction between impact or risk assessment was clear. I would point everyone to the comments. Everyone who wrote comments had different views on what those two terms meant. So I would suggest, no, it's not clear because even this panel didn't have a uniform view and the document would be improved if there was actually a paragraph that explicitly compared and contrasted the two terms with respect to EPA's views. And that's it. Thank you so much. Great points, Dr. Beck. Um, I think Dr. Marr said a number of things that I was going to basically say, but I wanted to be a, a little more explicit. I think it, you really need to differentiate between cumulative risk and cumulative impact, whereas risk assessment, as it's typically done under EPA framework, uses assumptions that tend to, um, tend to overestimate risk, the use of the linear no threshold model, the use of uncertainty factors, and so forth. Whereas to me, it seems that the cumulative impact assessment, you're looking at impacts that could be or are likely real. So you're comparing two very, seems to me, very different metrics. And I think that that distinction needs to be clearer in the document. Thank you, Dr. Beck. It's a great comment. Uh, Dr. Wilson, you're up. I'm trying to be succinct. I'm usually not succinct. Who, people who know yeah, me. Yeah, you're doing a great so, job. <laughs> so there's this whole term salutogenesis. I mentioned salutogenic and getting to John's previous comment about well-being. I think that that I offer that up as an opportunity to talk about the positive impacts more. A lot of times exposure science, we talk about negative impacts is very reductionist, right? 
what I was saying earlier is about cumulative impacts. There's also positive impacts, the ecosystem services and benefits. How do we capture that? And, and the economic benefits, right? So you have externalities, health externalities, economic externalities, social, right? Uh, ex externalities, but those benefits. And so salutogenesis, the salutogenic framework is a way to do that. So I'll offer that up and bring it in more of the social sciences and planning into this process. And then my other comment, this is a question to the EPA. What happened to all that work with the, the risk assessment form like 10 years ago? I remember writing a paper on cumulative risk assessment for that form. Was any of that information used as part of this process and figuring out the framing for cumulative risk when Devin Payne Sturgis was at the EPA? She worked with a team. I think she was part of that form. So has any of that work gone into informing the cumulative risk uh, language that y'all have reviewed as part of this document or will review moving forward? That's, and that's the question to the EPA. Yeah, thanks for that question. It looks like Maureen Gwynn put her screen on. So Maureen. Yes, uh, you know, thank you for that question. It is one that we've been asked. We've been working closely with the risk assessment forum team that's working on uh, the uh, CRA work for the guidelines. And um, yes, it is similar to what Devin Payne had worked, Sturgis had worked on when she was here um, previously. So there is some work going on with that. We are in close contact as far mm -hmm. as definitions and our definitions and where those sort of go. I, I would I would note that one of the things about this question I agree with, with Dr. Morris and others that we got a lot of variable responses in the pre-written comments. Um, and I think that will be helpful for us, but I think that's part of why this question um, was added here is because of the differing views on these two di different definitions. So thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. And you did get a lot of written comments on this and I know you'll get more in the final set of comments. Uh, so appreciate that. Let's move to the third question. And as I say, that one I know has a lot of uh, action in the written part already. So the third one is about gaps and barriers. Um, this is EPA's white paper describes science gaps and barriers to conducting and translating research on cumulative impact assessment. Uh, part A, please comment on the extent to which EPA has identified the key science gaps and barriers to conducting and translating research on cumulative impact assessment in this white paper as well as which of these are most important to prioritize and on what basis. And Dr. Thorne is up first. Yes, thank you. So I was, as I was reading through the report, I was thinking a lot about this um, and about really how do you operationalize parts of this in a quantitative sense. Um, so if we're thinking about the exposome as sort of the total measure of everything, one approach that's mentioned is biomarkers uh, biomarkers from chemical stressors could be things like oxidative stress, inflammation, endocrine dysregulation. But then we need to think about biomarkers of stress, um, which are being developed, but maybe aren't as far along. Um, and, and then how these relate to things like uh, exposure to uh, multiple sources of obesity or, or obesogenics, allergy, neurobehavioral change. And it, it seems like you need to have an exposure response relationship for the risks that um, can be uh, assessed by various biomarkers and then the outcomes that, that come from thereof. And so to try and put together the, the multifactor, the non-chemical and chemical stressors, um, that might be one way to inter operationalize this, but I think uh, a lot more research needs to be done to accomplish that. Um, and then the other thing I was just gonna mention is that there's a statement about um, ensuring data quality from things such as citizen science or traditional ecological knowledge. And that it, I think would be a big culture shift for the EPA, which traditionally has um, found it difficult to embrace citizen science that often doesn't use um, a lot of the, the tools that have been well validated by EPA through many years. Um, and I think the citizen science capabilities are improving as new sensor technology develops. So there might be a, a, a renewed and better opportunity to uh, really take a, a look at, at and perhaps even put out there some guidelines for citizen science that might be useful for decision making. Thanks, Dr. Thorne. And for others on the board, if you have literature to suggest about how um, that's been handled in other settings, that would be super helpful, I think, as well. Let's see, we have Dr. Emanuel and Dr. Shakabarty. Thanks, uh, I'd like to add on uh, to Dr. Thorne's comments and, and say that I think if we don't come up with clear and rigorous methods for incorporating indigenous and local knowledges into the decision frameworks, 
Um, I'm concerned it's going to be easy for regulators to dismiss these forms of evidence out of hand since they don't or if they don't conform to expectations about what quantitative or qualitative data should look like. And so I think if we do that, we risk acting in some cases with incomplete knowledge or without what, what is often the most relevant knowledge. And so there's a possibility of introducing bias um, into decisions through the exclusion of um, this relevant information or by privileging evidence that, that sometimes contradicts local or indigenous knowledge, but happens to be published in a more palatable format like peer reviewed literature or presented in an easily digestible format or what have you. Um, one way to address this could be through careful decisions about what kind of metadata or other contextual information that we attach to indigenous or local knowledges um, to, to support decision making and to support the incorporation of these knowledge streams um, into decision frameworks. Thank you. And I, I would say the same thing I said it to the last comment, because I think this is a super point. Um, if, if others have other information about context where they feel a good job has been done with that, please do consider putting that in your written comments because that's really uh, valuable and we've got a big group. So maybe people will know of sources or, or approaches. Thanks. Uh, let's see, Sh Dr. Chakrabarty, then Wilson, Annenberg, Kaiser, and then I'll see what comes up next. Okay, I'll just try to make it very quick. I have my hand up, let me raise it again, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, is it, is it up? It is, yes. Yes, you are at Kaiser, Lone Fight, then Honoraro. Yes. Go ahead, Chaco Party. Yes, I have two quick comments and suggestions, kind of follow up to you know what we were uh, just uh, what we just heard. It would be really helpful to clarify what the term qualitative data means in the context of this white paper, uh, you know, and you know especially it would be helpful to have some examples of qualitative data types that are relevant for cumulative impacts and cumulative impact assessment, just because the term gets thrown around in many different you know purposes for many different purposes and maybe potential sources. And that's just a way to validate them sometimes becomes difficult. So that would be really helpful. And the second one uh, would be like, uh, for uh, these days we have a wide range of, uh, you know, uh, non-traditional or emerging uh, geospatial uh, data, data that's being used. Uh, uh, and these range from, uh, you know, remotely sensed imagery for aerial photographs, satellite imagery, even Google Street View, Open Street Map uh, that are available and that have been used a lot, mainly for disaster planning and management that are also relevant here, I think. And, uh, and that includes, of course, crowdsourcing initiatives uh, related to that. So I, I, I wasn't sure if the EPA has, uh, EPA has started exploring that already. And also you have, uh, especially since there's, there was a lot of discussion on uh, high resolution local information, uh, uh, there is cadastral data from property tax assessors that a lot of people, at least in the recent literature, has used to uh, get a sense of you know, local environmental conditions and, uh, uh, and potential risks. So I was just curious if the EPA has thought about including these uh, less expensive and sometimes fairly uh, uh, inexpensive, or I guess, easily available uh, geospatial data in their impact assessments. I will stop. Thanks. Thank you, EPA representatives. Would someone like to respond? I can, I can take this. Um, we th those are great suggestions, and um, I think only when we were uh, we were conceiving of a streamlined white paper. But I think you know we can definitely expand it, put some examples, and um, consider some of your other suggestions. So so thank you. And uh, we are considering new data streams as well. Thank you very much. Uh, the order that shows on my screen, I know these aren't perfect, is Annenberg, Kaiser, Lone Fight, Anaruo, Wilson, and then Uzo Chukwu. Okay, great. I thought Shikobi was before me, sorry. Um, but, <laughs> sorry, Shikobi. Good to see everyone. Uh, I read this portion of the document as focusing largely on the exposure side. And I would have liked to see some more information about the health data um, representing underlying vulnerability of populations. There's really a large body of, of research from EPA and others showing how important those, um, those disease rates are in influencing the results of health impact assessments. Um, we still are dealing with, and I, I don't think I'm the first to say this on this call today, um, the member who said it earlier, but we're still dealing with 
major uh, lack of, of neighborhood scale information on, on disease rates. CDC is doing some work in this area, but uh, I think a lot more can, can be done and it's really necessary to uh, be able to adequately uh, capture not just the exposures, but the vulnerability of the population that is uh, um, exposed to these risk factors. Um, and then just also wanted to second Jay's uh, comment about novel geospatial data. Uh, there's really a lot of work happening in so many different areas, including satellite data and mobile monitoring and, um, and other, other aspects where we can really leverage uh, work that is already ongoing by others and, and already paid for. Um, and so really bringing that into this would be quite beneficial. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Dr. Wilson, I'm so sorry if my order on my screen isn't reflecting the... No, I can you know wait. I it jumps no, around. I've been talking a lot. I can wait. You can keep. You can keep uh, being cute where I am. Thanks. Go okay. Ahead. Sure. Yeah. Dr. Kaiser, and then Lone Fight, Anaruo, Wilson, Azu, Chuck Wu, and Lalama. Great. Thanks a lot. First of all, just want to say, you know, I really appreciate what EPA is trying to do here, and especially the spirit of this analysis. But I think for this section, what I was concerned about was trying to understand um, how EPA imagines that they would have the settings and statistical um, research designs available that allow them to say something about the causal impact of not only just one stressor, which can oftentimes be challenging, but multiple stressors in and of, them, in and of themselves, and was wondering whether or not EPA kind of envisions a certain type of research program that would then accompany this type of attempt to account for multiple, uh, multiple stressors. And so, um, in particular, I was thinking a lot about how Dr. Dawkins talked about having those types of, when we think about operationalizing these types of analyses on a national scale, having that dose response relationship and wondering whether or not EPA envisions future research that could then help us understand how those dose response relationships would change with different stressors and whether or not we even have the, the types of settings or statistical designs that allow us to answer those questions. And then the second point that I'll make really quickly as well is that um, going along with what others have talked about, I think that EPA might also want to just be prepared to have potentially some maybe unexpected results when they think about multiple stressors. So for an example, if we think about pollution that's impacting a recreational, say the, the benefits of um, recreating in a waterway, um, and if the, a regulation or action is only influencing, say, like one facility in a particular area, there might be lower benefits, even though there are other multiple stressors, than, than say, um, having just one facility in a very pristine area. So we might get these kind of unattended consequences where we might anticipate ahead of time if there are multiple <laughs> stressors, there might be higher benefits, but that might not always be the case. And then thinking about well, that is also in the setting that, well, if we could deal with all of those stressors, we might get to a different conclusion than if we can only deal with one of those stressors. And I think this gets at other people's comments about the fact that EPA um, should think carefully about what stressors they can address versus what stressors they can address and how that would play a part in any kind of benefit analysis they would do on these. Thanks. Next, would uh, EPA representatives like to respond? Hi, this is Tim. I can uh, also take a crack at some of those and if others wanted to as well, that'd be great. Um, in terms of do we have the statistical designs, I think, you know, the, the answer is there, there are potentially some designs that could be applied to some subsets of, of, of chemical and non-chemical stressors and, and for others, there probably aren't. And I think this comes into sort of the weight of evidence question and how it pertains to the decision context. Does the decision require a ultra quantitative approach? Can you use more indicator based information? Um, so I, I think that's part of the question is to understand how much or what information or how what type of combinations you would need to be able to initiate some actions and make some decisions. Um, so I, I think that's one thing is really looking at this from the perspective of the types of things you're trying to inform, the types of actions you're, you're trying to take. Um, and similarly for the, the second part, th there could be like multiple facilities 
for example, are all going to be contributing to traffic, like truck traffic in some way in a community. Um, and, and they're not regulated on their truck traffic necessarily and traffic and, and roadway infrastructures may be left to the local authorities. But the thing is that we're not coordinating on that level yet. We're not looking at, I mean, we'll look at truck traffic, but are we working as closely as we can with the people who are more you know, in charge of that to be able to try to address it from a more collaborative effort? And I think part of these questions on the, the level of quantification, um, the, 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 the other adverse impacts, it kind of comes down to really, you know, what can we do some things about? And taking it as sort of a staged approach to break it down and say some things can be made with uh, more relative scales of impacts. It is more like most likely to have an impact, you know, less likely, somewhat likely, not likely. You know, in de decisions can be made based on information like that. It, there's a question of can we do that within the EPA purview? Um, within the existing structure of the way EPA makes decisions, that could be very limited. And I think part of this is an exploration of what types of these approaches can we use right now under sort of the way things are, are written, but also given the way things are written and given what we know about cumulative impacts, what would be a more idealized or optimized way of doing this? How can we consider traffic and employment when we're talking about a permitting decision? Who would we have to engage with that? And how could we be more effective in using the data and information that we do have to clarify and provide a best practices approach? Thank you. Thanks, appreciate that response. Let's see, we are at Dr. Lone Fight, then Anaruo Wilson, Uzi Chakwu, Lalama, and Smith. Hi, um, uh, let me first introduce myself. Dosha Amid's Lisa Lone Fight. I wanna welcome you all to this conversation that I'm gonna share some things with you all. Very quick comment. Um, I did compose my comments for the, uh, for this session, but I um, didn't get them in in time for them to be um, publicly shared. So I'm going to read this comment really quick, but um, I appreciate everybody being here. I appreciate the opportunity. This is a new um, group for me, but um, a very, very important one to me. So um, when we're looking at evaluating cumulative impacts, it's important to include a community determination of specific value, worth, and merit. So communities often determine this based on factors um, that converge with, let's say, Western valuations, including livability, um, increased investment, et cetera. So indigenous communities, however, value community, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna use a specific, I wanna keep this specific so I, it's not so um, far reaching, it's so broad that we can't kind of take a look at that. So if we look at just, let's say, um, the impact that it has that these things have on um, our indigenous language preservations. Cultural transmission is imperative for, for um, our languages. And if we think about the cultural impact, let's say we, we say, oh, we lost one of our languages, that would be completely unacceptable to indigenous communities. Whereas maybe somebody else was looking at it saying, well, you know, we can mitigate that pretty easily. We'll throw some money towards a language project and, and you know, that, that would solve that issue. And then, so we look at that and we say, well, we don't really understand um, why elders are so important, um, why, um, why the language is so important. So what I have found through my, the way I was raised, in addition to my, the, um, the Western science education that I have is that, um, like I said, I'm using the, the language as an example. Our languages inform my science in terms of climate change. And this, I also experienced this on the Wind River Reservation. 
their languages informed their science, especially in the issues of climate change. And so when we're talking about a loss, people think, well, that's great. Um, nobody wants to um, disempower other groups, let's say, and I, I, don't, I don't feel like that's what's happening here. But we forget that it's not just for what was at one time or that people are able to um, use their languages or speak their languages. We, we will lose a lot more than that. And so that's why I think that the way that we look at evaluating cumulative impacts is um, that definition of the way we, we speak about that is, is truly um, important and um, how important the elders are and the um, oral tradition of um, the way we pass on knowledge is so important. And so I, I think that that's something that needs to be a part of this. I don't feel like it's, a, um, I don't want it to muddy the, the, um, the question, but I would like to hope that we can um, take a look at it as a data set and say, oh, wow, this is something that could help us in our future as well as right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that comment. All right, I have four more folks with their hands up on gaps and barriers and then we'll kind of take stock. So let's see, I have uh, Dr. Anaruo, Wilson, oh, I have five. <laughs> Uzo, Shakwu, Lalama and Smith. Okay, so I'll, I'll keep mine brief. Um, well, to, ad to really address the, uh, the gaps and barriers um, and to come up with a holistic cumulative impact um, assessment that would benefit everyone and especially those um, communities that are disproportionately affected. I think that, and I think it's been discussed um, earlier today, but we must have to incorporate a huge chunk of um, what we're looking at addressing from an environmental justice lens. And I think central to that, uh, which is very important when you dress, um, you're looking at environmental justice um, issues, it's looking, making sure that we're addressing equality and e equity in whatever um, assessment we're, we're um, uh, discussing and we're also um, addressing. Uh, it's been mentioned um, incorporating local knowledge uh, in cumulative impact, and that's very important. So um, coming up with a baseline of, you know, what I call endemic stressors, stressors that have always been there, and then adding on to whatever else, um, that also has to be addressed uh, from a community specific uh, view or, or lens, because each community is different. And that's how we have to address that equality slash um, equity in addressing that. And then finally, those, the voices, those indigenous voices and the local voices uh, come into play because they are the ones who have the lived, what we've been calling lived experiences. So as we come up with this holistic, um, hopefully holistic way mm -hmm. of addressing the cum cumulative impact and risk um, and, and uh, health impact assessment, we have to look at all of this and incorporate it into what would eventually um, be translated into a policy decision. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Uh, let's see, Dr. Wilson. Okay, thank you again. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's important. Uh, my colleagues, Susan, Jay, uh, Peter, uh, uh, Ryan, they made some very important comments earlier. That's why I put my hand up about, you know, community science. So I'm on the board of the Citizen Science Association. Uh, I, you have Citizen Science, we have community science, as, as was just stated. I think actually a lot of the innovation for doing the type of science that we're talking about, it's come from the community. So I know we're saying that, but that community science, that citizen science has been very innovative. And I will say that when it comes to scientific frameworks and, and you know, rigor, reproducibility, uh, data tra transparency, data quality, you know, no data is infallible. So I think we have to have a shift in the culture of how we, re we review community science and community data, because a lot of that data is actually innovative. It's been very impactful. In addition to that, you know, you need that to ground truth all these great models, right? So where's the ground truthing happening? Okay, so that's an important part of your cumulative impact assessment, and even cumulative and looking at cumulative risk as well. If you want to talk about that, 
where is your actual ground truth? So the folks who are doing the ground truth are the folks in the ground just said so. And then you think about a Bayes frame, right? Bayesian approach to what we're talking about. Community knowledge is specificatory knowledge. We have to integrate, integrate specificatory knowledge better into cumulative impact assessment. And so I just want to put that out there because I think there's some bias that comes in and not just the, the decision support tools, but bias and the scientific inputs into the decision support matrix, right? And we have to understand there's, 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 there's scientific bias against that. And there's, there's multiple types of biases. So we need to understand that not just uncertainty, but the bias that goes into the type of data. And that data is not this bias associated with industry data, this bias associated with government data, this bias associated with community data. The thing is having good QA, QC, and making sure that we are highly engaged in that, you know, that process. And I'll say this last point. The EPA has another uh, science advisory, uh, advisory uh, faculty, another faculty that's done some work on looking at citizen science and its utility and impact. So I will look at some of that work as well as we move forward with uh, a cumulative impacts uh, assessment. Thank you. Thanks. I, I really appreciate that. It was one of the things I had said before. If folks know of good examples or other existing information that's out there about incorporating citizen science uh, into these processes or uh, traditional indigenous knowledge or other things, just please do keep that flowing toward uh, EPA because I think they would really appreciate those examples. Uh, let's see, Dr. Uzo Shaku. Thank you, Madam Chair. I make life easy for you. You can call me Uzo, U Z O. Thank you. You can make it simple. Anyway, Dr. Uzo. Um, <laughs> yes, that makes it easy. But I just want to be as basic as I can. The first thing is the mission of EPA. That's important because uh, whatever we do has to align with that mission, which is pro protecting human health and the environment. And then when you look at that, I looked at the documents. I, I think you are talking about people. You are talking about where we live the cumulative impacts or cumulative impact assessments, that's about people. Okay, who are these people? So I looked and looked in the document, it's kind of not, um, not really something that somebody that doesn't know anything will pick up. So what I, what I would suggest is to have a section on environmental justice and then lay it out so that anybody who is reading all these uh, very, very important um, studies will know exactly where it's going. So a section in, on EJA, because you, if you look at it now, there are um, mentions of environmental justice here and there, but it doesn't come together. Who are these people? Because if you generalize and say people who are disenfranchised or people who live in, uh, people who are affected by uh, non-toxic chemicals and toxic chemicals, a lot of people don't know that. They don't understand that. And two, how does, or how do those communities get involved. Because if I'm sick, I'm the one sick, not you. You may be talking about be a doctor, looking at me, but you don't know what's happening to me. Yeah. So even though some of these issues cannot be mitigated right away, but it's important for people to know what they have and what is happening to them. So how does this whole thing that we have go to the community level because uh, it's science. From what the, the uh, press release yesterday from uh, what? press release from Mr. Brennan's office, uh, one of the important things is that science drives decisions. Those decisions affect people. So I like to see environmental justice highlighted in the document. And also if I'm writing this, I'm going to lead it to the mission of the of EPA. It's two lines, so that uh, when you are thinking, you are looking at that. Whatever you are doing aligns with that. So overall, this is a superb job. It's, it's good. Hopefully, we'll make it better. 
that's that's all I have, guys. Thank you, Dr. Rizzo. <laughs> so let me just acknowledge that it is uh, 5 p.m. on the East Coast, 2 o'clock, two minutes past on the West Coast. Uh, we have two more commenters, um, Dr. Ma and Dr. Smith, who I will call on. And then I think we will save the fourth question for uh, for our meeting next Monday unless I get a signal otherwise from the SAB staff office. These are excellent comments. I don't want to shut this conversation down. I think it's been in just a really wealth of, of input for uh, EPA. So really appreciating that. So I'm going to move to Dr. Ma. Great. Thanks, Dr. Cohen. Um, just really quickly, two comments. Um, so uh, I think the data gap is really important to address. Um, and it was the, I think the section was pretty comprehensive. Um, I just did want to add, so there was a lot of... Um, a uh, discussion about how there's this, there's in, like better spatial data um, on, you know, all sorts of kind of stressors. Uh, but I also just wanted to add, it's really important to get uh, information or data on behaviors in response to uh, some of these stressors, because, you know, if we just, two places that look exactly the same in terms of kind of ambient pollution levels, uh, well, the people there might not experience those uh, pollutants the same way because people people move or people you know install air filters and things like that. So, uh, kind of data on behaviors, I think, is another uh, is a is a difficult gap um, to overcome. The second comment I just had, uh, so uh, so the second comment related is kind of related to a barrier, I guess, um, and so uh, it, it's it's. I think the the need to consider some of these feedback effects that are that that happen when we think about cumulative impacts, and this reminds this kind of relates to, I believe, Dr. Ar Arvai's earlier comment about some of the stressors being also consequences. Um, and then when we think about dynamic impacts with with kind of the market uh, and economic effects. Um, that also then ultimately affects our well-being. So, so um, I think some some additional discussion about that in the gaps and barriers section will be really useful. Thanks. Thanks. So those are great points for the gaps and barriers section. Uh, Dr. Smith, you're up. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll I'll try to be quick myself as well. Um, so there've been a couple of of comments along the lines of do we have the statistical designs to answer these sorts of questions. I'd like to suggest the answer is, is yes. Um, and while I realize that the discussion we've had this afternoon is much broader than just the question of air pollution, um, there is literature within the air pollution scientific community on um, joint effects of, of multiple pollutants. I'll, I'll try to put some references into, into the written version of this discussion. And some of that uses machine learning methods that are designed to answer questions of causality to, to respond to a point that Dr. Kaiser, I think it was, made earlier. Um, but could I just make a comment here to EPA? Um, I've definitely been involved in discussions with the air pollution community along the lines of, well, we shouldn't really look at these issues because EPA is committed to a one pollutant at a time approach, and therefore there's no real point in looking at other approaches. Um, if that's no longer true, well, first comment is that I'm delighted to hear it because I certainly think EPA should be focusing on multi-pollutant approaches, um, whether just air pollution or more, more generally. Um, but I also think EPA needs to get that message out to the scientific community because there's a there's a two way conversation here. The scientific community responds to what it hears from EPA, and at the same time, as we've heard, EPA tries to take on what the scientific community is doing. So there's definitely a need for two way communications. Thank you. Thanks. That was very succinct, and uh, I'm sure EPA appreciates the the input and the specific references that you can send in your written comments. Uh, let's see, Dr. Alien. Thank you. I, I just want to also say I understand that EPA, this is such a great step to take and it's, a, it's tremendously time consuming. And, um, and that's one of the difficulties I see in some of the comments is the different scales that a lot of these impacts uh, really reside in. And so you might talk about something very small scale biomarkers or a specific health outcome and then things that are so large scale like well-being and so I think the challenge really is to think about how to treat those I'm not going to use the word um, equally because of course some may apply more in certain instances than other instances uh, but to really 
uh, appreciate the value of a lot of the things that sometimes are on the broader scale that as scientists or for myself, we may not have as much experience working with, or there's more uncertainty working with those kind of concepts. But I think it's very important that, um, that there's some type of decision-making process so that there's really an incorporation of the things where there's greater uncertainty, even though I know we need to, uh, from the outside scientific aspect, that that can be hard to defend from a regulatory agency standpoint. Thanks for that comment. Appreciate that. I think we've called everyone. Oh, hold on. There's another hand. Uh, let me rearrange it's my me. Screen. It's Dr. Neptune. Oh, Dr. Neptune, <laughs> please go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I just have a couple of comments. I'll make them quick. I've been listening to everyone. And, you know, I, I, I do appreciate the ambition of this effort. And, and I think it's meritable. I think it's important. But there are, were three considerations that I was waiting for someone to bring up, but were not brought up. And I think they are trenchant. The first is that there are relevant regional differences that have to be integrated in any type of cumulative impact construct, because we all know that rural poor experience all of these factors differently than urban poor. And I had the sense that some of the constructions and concepts that were presented in the report really slanted more towards the urban experience and urban communities that are disadvantaged. And I think we have to integrate some of the factors in rural communities that may be similarly impactful, but different, but distinct. The second issue I wanted us to think about is that these one size fits all paradigms are going to be problematic. And if we want to use dose response paradigms, there are going to be certain stressors that will conform to that much more easily. And maybe those should be prioritized kind of in our kind of research uh, projections and our research priorities, as opposed to some of the other ones that may not conform as easily and we need to gather more data to see if they do. And, and my last point is one that I take very seriously, and that is to not make biology a four letter word. What we've learned through biological investigation about trenchant aspects of disease and risk and resiliency like aging have been tremendous. And if we can possibly integrate what we know now into kind of all of our kind of assessments about cumulative risk, cumulative impacts, when it comes to EPA relevant exposures, I think that's where we're going to get the highest bang for the buck. And I think we really need to appreciate biology because it, it can be transformative. That's all I have to say. <laughs> you were super succinct and packed a lot into that short period of time. So much appreciated. That's very much appreciated. I have to say, I am absolutely delighted with the quality of this conversation and the number of different people who, who weighed in. I think it speaks highly of the board and the scope that we want to cover and that all of our fields cover. So thank you all so much for engaging in this agenda and engaging with EPA. I, you know, on behalf of EPA also, I thank you so much for coming and presenting your information to us and, and talking to us and responding. And we asked you some impossible questions. So thank you for fielding those with such grace. I hope that we're partners in this and are um, sending some, maybe some literature, maybe some examples your way on, on some of these points that folks have made. I think that would probably be a very welcome contribution uh, from the board. And also just pointing out where, you know, we know there's still work to do. And so making that clear, being very specific about where that work is and what needs to be done, I think is also very much appreciated. We did run over a little. Um, I do want to carry the fourth question to next Monday, because I feel like if we do part of it now and part of it Monday, we'll just kind of tread some ground and then we'll go over the same ground again. So this is really important work. This is a really complex topic and everyone's focus has been amazing through this period of time. I know folks need a break and on the East Coast, it's the end of the day. So I am going to turn this over to Tom Armitage, but first just say thank you so much to the SAB board. Thank you so much to EPA who joined us, our liaisons and our staff office uh, and the public commenters who I don't think are necessarily on, although they may be, um, really appreciated them bringing their experience and their comments to us. We need to hear from them and we did, and so thank you. Okay, well, thank you all very much. Uh, 
if there's nothing else to cover for today, uh, I will uh, recess the meeting for the day and we 